Chapter 1 of The Treasure Train This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Treasure Train by Arthur B. Reeve The Treasure Train I am not by nature a spy, Professor Kennedy, but, well, sometimes one is forced into something like that. Maud Houston, who had sought out Craig in his laboratory, was a striking girl, not merely because she was pretty or because her gown was modish. Perhaps it was her sincerity and alertness that made her attractive. She was the daughter of Barry Houston, president of the Continental Express Company, and one could readily see why, aside from the position her father held, she should be among the most sought-after young women in the city. Miss Houston looked straight into Kennedy's eyes as she added, without waiting for him to ask a question, "'Yesterday I heard something that has made me think a great deal. You know, we live at the St. Germain when we are in town. I've noticed for several months past that the lobbies are full of strange foreign-looking people. Well, yesterday afternoon I was sitting alone in the tea-room of the hotel waiting for some friends. On the other side of a huge palm I heard a couple whispering. I have seen the woman about the hotel often, although I know that she doesn't live there. The man I don't remember ever having seen before. They mentioned the name of Granville Barnes, treasurer of Father's company. Is that so? cut in Kennedy quickly. I read the story about him in the papers this morning. As for myself, I was instantly alive with interest, too. Granville Barnes had been suddenly stricken while riding in his car in the country and the report had it that he was hovering between life and death in the general hospital. The chauffeur had been stricken, too, by the same incomprehensible malady, though apparently not so badly. How the chauffeur managed to save the car was a miracle, but he had brought it to a stop beside the road, where the two were found gasping, a quarter of an hour later, by a passing motorist, who rushed them to a doctor who had them transferred to the hospital in the city. Neither of them seemed able or willing to throw any light on what had happened. "'Just what was it you overheard?' encouraged Kennedy. "'I heard the man tell the woman,' Miss Houston replied slowly, "'that now was the chance, when any of the great warring powers would welcome and wink at any blow that might cripple the other to the slightest degree. I heard him say something about the Continental Express Company, and that was enough to make me listen, for, you know, Father's company is handling the big shipments of gold and securities that are coming here from abroad by way of Halifax. Then I heard her mention the names of Mr. Barnes and Mr. Lane, too, the general manager. She paused, as though not relishing the idea of having the names bandied about. Last night the, the attack on him, for that is all I can think it was, occurred. As she stopped again, I could not help thinking what a tale of strange plotting the casual conversation suggested. New York, I knew, was full of high-class international crooks and flim-flammers who would flock there because the great field of their operations in Europe was closed. The war had literally dumped them on us. Was someone using a band of these crooks for ulterior purposes? The idea opened up wide possibilities. Of course, Miss Houston continued, that is all I know but I think I am justified in thinking that the two things, the shipment of gold here and the attack, have some connection. Oh, can't you take up the case and look into it? She made her appeal so winsomely that it would have been difficult to resist, even if it had not promised to prove important. I should be glad to take up the matter, replied Craig, quickly adding, if Mr. Barnes will let me. Oh, he must, she cried. I haven't spoken to father, but I know that he would approve of it. I know he thinks I haven't any head for business just because I wasn't born a boy. I want to prove to him that I can protect the company's interests. And Mr. Barnes, why, of course, he will approve. She said it with an assurance that made me wonder. It was only then that I recollected that it had been one of the excuses for printing her picture in the society columns of the star so often that the pretty daughter of the president of the Continental was being ardently wooed by two of the company's younger officials. Granville Barnes himself was one. The other was Rodman Lane, the young general manager. I wish now that I had paid more attention to the society news. Perhaps I should have been in a better position to judge which of them it was whom she really had chosen. 
As it was, two questions presented themselves to me. Was it Barnes? And had Barnes really been the victim of an attack or of an accident? Kennedy may have been thinking the problems over, but he gave no evidence of it. He threw on his hat and coat and was ready in a moment to be driven in Miss Houston's car to the hospital. There, after the usual cutting of red tape which only Miss Houston could have accomplished, we were led by a white uniformed nurse through the silent halls to the private room occupied by Barnes. It's a most peculiar case, whispered the young doctor in charge as we paused at the door. I want you to notice his face and his cough. His pulse seems very weak, almost imperceptible at times. The stethoscope reveals subcrepitant sounds all over his lungs. It's like bronchitis or pneumonia, but it isn't either. We entered. Barnes was lying there almost in a state of unconsciousness. As we stood watching him, he opened his eyes, but he did not see us. His vision seemed to be riveted on Miss Houston. He murmured something that we could not catch, and as his eyes closed again, his face seemed to relax into a peaceful expression, as though he were dreaming of something happy. Suddenly, however, the old tense lines reappeared. Another idea seemed to have been suggested. Is Lane hiring the men himself? he murmured. The sight of Maud Houston had prompted the thought of his rival, now with a clear field. What did it mean? Was he jealous of Lane, or did his words have a deeper meaning? What difference could it have made if Lane had a free hand in managing the shipment of treasures for the company? Kennedy looked long and carefully at the face of the sick man. It was blue and cyanose still, and his lips had a violet tinge. Barnes had been coughing a great deal. Now and then his mouth was flecked with foamy blood, which the nurse wiped gently away. Kennedy picked up a piece of the blood-soaked gauze. A moment later we withdrew from the room as quietly as we had entered and tiptoed down the hall, Miss Houston and the young doctor following us more slowly. As we reached the door I turned to see where she was. A distinguished-looking elderly gentleman, sitting in the waiting room, had happened to glance up as she passed and had moved quickly to the hall. "'What? You here, Maud?' we heard him say. "'Yes, Father. I thought I might be able to do something for Granville.' She accompanied the remark with a sidelong glance and nod at us, which Kennedy interpreted to mean that we might as well keep in the background. Houston himself, far from chiding her, seemed rather to be pleased than otherwise. We could not hear all they said, but one sentence was wafted over. It's most unfortunate, Maud, at just this time. It leaves the whole matter in the hands of Lane. At the mention of Lane, which her father accompanied by a keen glance, she flushed a little and bit her lip. I wondered whether it meant more than that, of the two suitors, her father obviously preferred Barnes. Houston had called to see Barnes, and as the doctor led him up the hall again, Miss Houston rejoined us. You need not drive us back, thanked Kennedy. Just drop us at the subway. I'll let you know the moment I have arrived at any conclusion. On the train we happened to run across a former classmate, Moorhead, who had gone into the brokerage business. Queer about that Barnes case, isn't it, suggested Kennedy, after the usual greetings were over. Then, without suggesting that we were more than casually interested, what does the street think of it? It is queer, rejoined Moorhead. All the boys downtown are talking about it, wondering how it will affect the transit of the gold shipments. I don't know what would happen if there should be a hitch, but they ought to be able to run the thing through all right. It's a pretty ticklish piece of business, then, I suggested. Well, you know the state of the market just now. A little push one way or the other means a lot. And I suppose you know that the insiders on the street have boosted Continental Express up until it is practically one of the war stocks, too. Well, goodbye. Here's my station. We had scarcely returned to the laboratory, however, when a car drove up furiously and a young man bustled in to see us. You do not know me, he introduced, but I am Rodman Lane, general manager of the Continental Express. You know our company has had charge of the big shipments of gold and securities to New York. I suppose you've read about what happened to Barnes, our treasurer. I don't know anything about it, haven't even time to find out. All I know is that it puts more work on me, and I'm nearly crazy already. I watched him narrowly. 
We've had little trouble of any kind so far, he hurried on, until just now I learned that all the roads over which we are likely to send the shipments have been finding many more broken rails than usual. Kennedy had been following him keenly. I should like to see some samples of them, he observed. You would? said Lane eagerly. I have a couple of sections sawed from rails down at my office, where I asked the officials to send them. We made a hurry trip down to the express company's office. Kennedy examined the sections of rails minutely with a strong pocket lens. No ordinary break, he commented. You can see that it was an explosive that was used, an explosive well and properly tamped down with wet clay. Without tamping, the rails would have been bent, not broken. Done by wreckers, then? Lane asked. Certainly not defective rails, replied Kennedy. Still, I don't think you need to worry so much about them for the next train. You know what to guard against. Having been discovered, whoever they are, they'll probably not try it again. It's some new wrinkle that must be guarded against. It was small comfort, but Craig was accustomed to being brutally frank. Have you taken any other precautions now that you didn't take before? Yes, replied Lane slowly. The railroad has been experimenting with wireless on its trains. We have placed wireless on ours, too. It can't cut us off by cutting wires. Then, of course, as before, we shall use a pilot train to run ahead and a strong guard on the train itself. But now I feel that there may be something else that we can do. So I have come to you. When does the next shipment start? asked Kennedy. Tomorrow, from Halifax. Kennedy appeared to be considering something. The trouble, he said at length, is likely to be at this end. Perhaps before the train starts, something may happen that will tell us just what additional measures to take as it approaches New York. While Kennedy was at work with the blood-soaked gauze that he had taken from Barnes, I could do nothing but try to place the relative positions of the various actors in the little drama that was unfolding. Lane himself puzzled me. Sometimes I felt almost sure that he knew that Miss Houston had come to Kennedy, and that he was trying in this way to keep in touch with what was being done for Barnes. Some things I knew already. Barnes was comparatively wealthy, and had evidently the stamp of approval of Maud Houston's father. As for Lane, he was far from wealthy, although ambitious. The company was in a delicate situation where an act of omission would count for as much as an act of commission. Whoever could foresee what was going to happen might capitalize that information for much money. If there was a plot and Barnes had been a victim, what was its nature? I recalled Miss Houston's overheard conversation in the tea room. Both names had been mentioned. In short, I soon found myself wondering whether someone might not have tempted Lane either to do or not to do something. I wish you'd go over to the St. Germain, Walter, remarked Kennedy at length, looking up from his work. Don't tell Miss Houston of Lane's visit, but ask her if she will keep an eye out for that woman she heard talking, and the man too. They may drop in again, and tell her that if she hears anything else, no matter how trivial about Barnes, she must let me know. I was glad of the commission. Not only had I been unable to arrive anywhere in my conjectures, but it was something even to have a chance to talk with a girl like Maud Houston. Fortunately, I found her at home, and though she was rather disappointed that I had nothing to report, she received me graciously, and we spent the rest of the evening watching the varied life of the fashionable hostelry in the hope of chancing on the holders of the strange conversation in the tea room. Once in a while an idea would occur to her of someone who was in a position to keep her informed if anything further happened to Barnes, and she would dispatch a messenger with a little note. Finally, as it grew late, and the adventurous of the tea room episode seemed unlikely to favor the St. Germain with their presence again that night, I made my excuses, having had the satisfaction only of having delivered Kennedy's message, without accomplishing anything more. In fact, I was still unable to determine whether there was any sentiment stronger than sympathy that prompted her to come to Kennedy about Barnes. As for Lane, his name was scarcely mentioned except when it was necessary. It was early the next morning that I rejoined Craig at the laboratory. I found him studying the solution which he had extracted from the blood-soaked gauze after first removing the blood in a little distilled water. Before him was his new spectroscope, and I could see that now he was satisfied with what the uncannily delicate light detective had told him. 
He pricked his finger and let a drop of blood fall into a little fresh distilled water, some of which he placed in the spectroscope. Look through it, he said. Blood diluted with water shows the well-known dark bands between D and E, known as the oxyhemoglobin absorption. I looked as he indicated and saw the dark bands. Now, he went on, I add some of this other liquid. He picked up a bottle of something with a faint greenish tinge. See the bands gradually fade? I watched, and indeed they did diminish in intensity and finally disappear, leaving an uninterrupted and brilliant spectrum. My spectroscope, he said simply, shows that the blood crystals of Barnes are colorless. Barnes was poisoned by some gas, I think. I wish I had time to hunt along the road where the accident took place. As he said it, he walked over and drew from a cabinet several peculiar arrangements made of gauze. He was about to say something more when there came a knock at the door. Kennedy shoved the gauze arrangements into his pocket and opened it. It was Maud Houston, breathless and agitated. Oh, Mr. Kennedy, have you heard? she cried. You asked me to keep a watch whether anything more happened to Mr. Barnes. So I asked some friends of his to let me know of anything. He has a yacht, the Seagull, which has been lying off City Island. Well, last night the captain received a message to go to the hospital that Mr. Barnes wanted to see him. Of course it was a fake. Mr. Barnes was too sick to see anybody on business. But when the captain got back, he found that, on one pretext or another, the crew had been got ashore, and the seagull is gone, stolen. Some men in a small boat must have overpowered the engineer. Anyhow, she has disappeared. I know that no one could expect to steal the yacht, at least for very long. She'd be recognized soon, but they must know that, too. Kennedy looked at his watch. It is only a few hours since the train started from Halifax, he considered. It will be due in New York early tomorrow morning. Twenty million dollars in gold and thirty millions in securities. A seven-car steel train with forty armed guards. I know it, she said anxiously, and I'm so afraid something is going to happen. Ever since I had to play the spy. But what could anyone want with a yacht? Kennedy shrugged his shoulders noncommittally. It is one of the things that Mr. Lane must guard against, he remarked simply. She looked up quickly. Mr. Lane? she repeated. Yes, replied Kennedy. The protection of the train has fallen on him. I shall meet the train myself when it gets to Wooster and come in on it. I don't think there can be any danger before it reaches that point. Will Mr. Lane go with you? He must, decided Kennedy. That train must be delivered safely here in this city. Maud Houston gave Craig one of her penetrating direct looks. You think there is danger, then? I cannot say, he replied. Then I am going with you, she exclaimed. Kennedy paused and met her eyes. I do not know whether he read what was back of her sudden decision. At least I could not, unless there was something about Rodman Lane which she wished to have cleared up. Kennedy seemed to read her character and know that a girl like Maud Houston would be a help in any emergency. Very well, he agreed. Meet us at Mr. Lane's office in half an hour. Walter, see whether you can find Whiting. Whiting was one of Kennedy's students with whom he had been lately conducting some experiments. I hurried out and managed to locate him. What is it you suspect, I asked, when we returned? A wreck, some spectacular stroke at the nations that are shipping the gold? Perhaps, he replied absently, as he and Whiting hurriedly assembled some parts of instruments that were on a table in an adjoining room. Perhaps, I repeated. What else might there be? Robbery. Robbery, I exclaimed, of twenty million dollars? Why, man, just consider the mere weight of the metal. That's all very well, he replied, warming up a bit as he saw that Whiting was getting things together quickly. But it needs only a bit of twenty millions to make a snug fortune. He paused and straightened up as the gathering of the peculiar electrical apparatus, whatever it was, was completed. And, he went on quickly, consider the effect on the stock market of the news. That's the big thing. I could only gasp. A modern train robbery planned in the heart of dense traffic. Why not, he queried. Nothing is impossible if you can only take the other fellow unawares. Our job is not to be taken unawares. Are you ready, Whiting? 
Yes, sir, replied the student, shouldering the apparatus, for which I was very thankful, for my arms had frequently ached, carrying about some of Kennedy's weird but often weighty apparatus. We piled into a taxicab and made a quick journey to the office of the Continental Express. Maud Euston had already preceded us, and we found her standing by Lane's desk as he paced the floor. "'Please, Miss Euston, don't go,' he was saying as we entered. "'But I want to go,' she persisted, more than ever determined, apparently. "'I have engaged Professor Kennedy just for the purpose of foreseeing what new attack can be made on us,' he said. "'You have engaged Professor Kennedy?' she asked. I think I have a prior claim there, haven't I? she appealed. Kennedy stood for a moment, looking from one to the other. What was there in the motives that actuated them? Was it fear, hate, love, jealousy? I can serve my two clients only if they yield to me, Craig remarked quietly. Don't set that down, Whiting. Which is it? Yes or no? Neither Lane nor Miss Houston looked at each other for a moment. Is it in my hands? repeated Craig. Yes, bit off Lane sourly. And you, Miss Houston? Of course, she answered. Then we all go, decided Craig. Lane, may I install this thing in your telegraph room outside? Anything you say, Lane returned, unmollified. Whiting set to work immediately, while Kennedy gave him the final instructions. Neither Lane nor Miss Houston spoke a word, even when I left the room for a moment, fearing that three was a crowd. I could not help wondering whether she might not have heard something more from the woman in the tea-room conversation than she had told us. If she had, she had been more frank with Lane than with us. She must have told him. Certainly she had not told us. It was the only way I could account for the armed truce that seemed to exist as, hour after hour, our train carried us nearer the point where we were to meet the treasure train. At Wooster we still had a long wait for the argosy that was causing so much anxiety and danger. It was long after the time schedule that we left finally, on our return journey, late at night. Ahead of us went the dummy pilot train to be sacrificed if any bridges or trestles were blown up, or if any new attempts were made at producing artificially broken rails. We four established ourselves as best we could in a car in the center of the treasure train, with one of the armed guards as company. Mile after mile we reeled off, ever southward and westward. We must have crossed the state of Connecticut and have been approaching Long Island Sound, when suddenly the train stopped with a jerk. Ordinarily there is nothing to grow alarmed about at the mere stopping of a train, but this was an unusual train under unusual circumstances. No one said a word as we peered out. Down the track the signal seemed to show a clear road. What was the matter? Look! exclaimed Kennedy suddenly. Off a distance ahead I could see what looked like a long row of white fuses sticking up in the faint starlight. From them the fresh west wind seemed to blow a thick curtain of greenish-yellow smoke which swept across the track, enveloping the engine and the forward cars and now advancing toward us like the yellow wind of northern China. It seemed to spread thickly on the ground, rising scarcely more than sixteen or eighteen feet. A moment and the cloud began to fill the air about us. There was a paralyzing odor. I looked about at the others, gasping and coughing. As the cloud rolled on, inexorably increasing in density, it seemed literally to grip the lungs. It flashed over me that already the engineer and fireman had been overcome, though not before the engineer had been able to stop the train. As the cloud advanced, the armed guards ran from it, shouting, one now and then falling, overcome. For the moment none of us knew what to do. Shall we run and desert the train for which we had dared so much? To stay was death. Quickly, Kennedy pulled from his pocket the gauze arrangements he had had in his hand that morning, just as Miss Euston's knock had interrupted his conversation with me. Hurriedly, he shoved one into Miss Euston's hands, then to Lane, then to me, and to the guard who was with us. Wet them, he cried, as he fitted his own over his nose and staggered to a water cooler. What is it? I gasped hoarsely as we all imitated his every action. Chlorine gas, he rasped back, the same gas that overcame Granville Barnes. These masks are impregnated with a glycerin solution of sodium phosphate. It was chlorine that destroyed the red coloring matter in Barnes' blood. No wonder, when this action of just a whiff of it on us is so rapid. Even a short time longer in death would follow. 
It destroys without the possibility of reconstitution, and it leaves a dangerous deposit of albumin. How do you feel? All right, I lied. We looked out again. The things that looked like fuses were not bombs, as I had expected, but big reinforced bottles of gas compressed at high pressure with the taps open. The supply was not inexhaustible. In fact, it was decidedly limited, but it seemed to have been calculated to a nicety to do the work. Only the panting of the locomotive now broke the stillness as Kennedy and I moved forward along the track. Crack! Rang out a shot! Get on the other side of the train! Quick! ordered Craig. In the shadow, aside from the direction in which the wind was wafting the gas, we could now just barely discern a heavy but powerful motor truck and figures moving about it. As I peered out from the shelter of the train, I realized what it all meant. The truck, which had probably conveyed the gas tanks from the rendezvous where they had been collected, was there now to convey to some dark wharf what of the treasure could be seized. There the stolen yacht was waiting to carry it off. Don't move! Don't fire! cautioned Kennedy. Perhaps they will think it was only a shadow they saw. Let them act first. They must. They haven't any too much time. Let them get impatient. For some minutes we waited. Sure enough, separated widely, but converging toward the treasure train at last, we could see several dark figures making their way from the road across a strip of field and over the rails. I made a move with my gun. Don't, whispered Kennedy. Let them get together. His ruse was clever. Evidently they thought that it had been indeed a wraith at which they had fired. Swiftly now they hurried to the nearest of the gold-laden cars. We could hear them, breaking in where the guards had either been rendered unconscious or had fled. I looked around at Maud Houston. She was the calmest of us all as she whispered, They are in the car. Can't we do something? Lane, whispered Kennedy, crawl through under the trucks with me. Walter and you, Duggan, he added to the guard, go down the other side. We must rush them, in the car. As Kennedy crawled under the train again, I saw Maud Houston follow Lane closely. How it happened I cannot describe, for the simple reason that I don't remember. I know that it was a short, sharp dash, that the fight was a fight of fists in which guns were discharged wildly in the air against the will of the gunner. But from the moment when Kennedy's voice rang out in the door, Hands up! to the time that I saw that we had the robbers lined up with their backs against the heavy cases of the precious metal for which they had planned and risked so much. It is a blank of grim death struggle. I remember my surprise at seeing one of them a woman, and I thought I must be mistaken. I looked about. No, there was Maud Houston standing just beside Lane. I think it must have been that which recalled me and made me realize that it was a reality and not a dream. The two women stood glaring at each other. The woman in the tea room, exclaimed Miss Houston. It was about this robbery, then, that I heard you talking the other afternoon. I looked at the face before me. It was, had been, a handsome face. But now it was cold and hard, with that heartless expression of the adventurous. The men seemed to take their plight hard. But as she looked into the clear grey eyes of the other woman, the adventurous seemed to gain rather than lose in defiance. Robbery? she repeated bitterly. This is only a beginning. A beginning? What do you mean? It was Lane who spoke. Slowly she turned toward him. You know well enough what I mean. The implication that she intended was clear. She had addressed the remark to him, but it was a stab at Maud Houston. I only know what you wanted me to do, and I refused. Is there more still? I wondered whether Lane could really have been involved. Quick, what do you mean? demanded Kennedy authoritatively. The woman turned to him. Suppose this news of the robbery is out. What will happen? Do you want me to tell you, young lady? She added, turning again to Maud Houston. I'll tell you. The stock of the Continental Express Company will fall like a house of cards. And then? Those who have sold it at the top price will buy it back again at the bottom. The company is sound. The depression will not last. Perhaps will be over in a day, a week, a month. Then the operators can send it up again. Don't you see? It is the old method of manipulation in a new form. It is a worse stock gamble. Other stocks will be affected the same way. 
This is our reward, what we can get out of it by playing this game for which the materials are furnished free. We have played it and lost. The manipulators will get their reward on the stock market this morning, but they must still reckon with us even if we have lost. She said it with a sort of grim humor. And you have put Granville Barnes out of the way first, I asked, remembering the chlorine. She laughed shrilly. That was an accident, his own carelessness. He was carrying a tank of it for us. Only his chauffeur's presence of mind and throwing it into the shrubbery by the road saved his life and reputation. No, young man, he was one of the manipulators too. But the chief of them was... She paused as if to enjoy one brief moment to triumph at least. The president of the company, she added. No, 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 cried Maud Houston. Yes, yes, yes. He does not dare deny it. They were all in it. Mrs. Labrette, you lie, towered Lane, in a surging passion, as he stepped forward and shook his finger at her. You lie and you know it. There is an old saying about the fury of a woman scorned. She paid no attention to him whatever. Maud Houston, she hissed, as though Lane had been as inarticulate as the boxes of gold about. You have saved your lover's reputation, perhaps. At least the shipment is safe. But you have ruined your father. The deal will go through. Already that has been arranged. You may as well tell Kennedy to let us go and let the thing go through. It involves more than us. Kennedy had been standing back a bit, carefully keeping them all covered. He glanced a moment out of the corner of his eye at Maud Houston, but said nothing. It was a terrible situation. Had Lane really been in it? That question was overshadowed by the mention of her father. Impulsively, she turned to Craig. Oh, save him, she cried. Can't anything be done to save my father in spite of himself? It is too late, mocked Mrs. Lebret. People will read the account of the robbery in the papers even if it didn't take place. They will see it before they see a denial. Orders will flood in to sell the stock. No, it can't be stopped. Kennedy glanced momentarily at me. Is there still time to catch the last morning edition of the Star, Walter? He asked quietly. I glanced at my watch. We may try. It's possible. Write a dispatch. An accident to the engine. Train delayed. Now proceeding. Anything. Here, Dugan, you keep them covered. Shoot to kill if there's a move. Kennedy had begun feverishly setting up the part of the apparatus which he had brought after Whiting had set up his. What can you do, hissed Mrs. Lebret? You can't get word through. Orders have been issued that the telegraph operators are under no circumstances to give out news about this train. The wireless is out of commission, too. The operator overcome. The robbery story has been prepared and given out by this time. Already reporters are being assigned to follow it up. I looked over at Kennedy. If orders had been given for such secrecy by Barry Houston, how could my dispatch do any good? It would be held back by the operators. Craig quickly slung a wire over those by the side of the track and seized what I had written, scenting furiously. What are you doing? I asked. You heard what she said. One thing you can be certain of, he answered, that dispatch can never be stolen or tapped by spies. Why, what is this? I asked, pointing to the instrument. The invention of Major Squire of the Army, he replied, by which any number of messages may be sent at the same time over the same wire without the slightest conflict. Really, it consists of making wireless electric waves travel along instead of inside the wire. In other words, he had discovered the means of concentrating the energy of a wireless wave on a given point instead of letting it riot all over the face of the earth. It is the principle of wireless, but in ordinary wireless, less than one millionth part of the original sending force reaches the point for which it is intended. The rest is scattered through space in all directions. If the vibrations of a current are of a certain number per second, the current will follow a wire to which it is, as it were, attached, instead of passing off into space. All the energy in wireless formerly wasted in radiation in every direction now devotes itself solely to driving the current through the ether about the wire. Thus it goes until it reaches the point where whiting is, where the vibrations correspond to its own and are in tune. There it reproduces ascending impulse. It is wired wireless. Craig had long since finished sending his wired wireless message. 
We waited impatiently. The seconds seemed to drag like hours. Far off now, we could hear a whistle as a train finally approached slowly into our block, creeping up to see what was wrong. But that made no difference now. It was not any help they could give us that we wanted. A greater problem, the saving of one man's name and the re-establishment of another, confronted us. Unexpectedly, the little wired wireless instrument before us began to buzz. Quickly, Kennedy seized a pencil and wrote as the message that no hand of man could interfere with was flashed back to us. It is for you, Walter, from the star, he said, simply handing me what he had written on the back of an old envelope. I read, almost afraid to read. Robbery story killed. Black type across pagehead last edition. Treasure train safe. McGrath. Show it to Miss Houston, Craig added simply, gathering up his wired wireless set just as the crew from the train behind us ran up. She may like to know that she has saved her father from himself through misunderstanding her lover. I thought Maud Houston would faint as she clutched the message. Lane caught her as she reeled backward. Rodman, can you forgive me? she murmured simply, yielding to him and looking up into his face. End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of the Treasure Train》by Arthur B. Reeve. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Truth Detector. You haven't heard, no one outside has heard, of the strange illness and the robbery of my employer, Mr. Mansfield, Diamond Jack Mansfield, you know. Our visitor was a slight, very pretty, but extremely nervous girl, who had given us a card bearing the name Miss Helen Gray. Illness? Robbery? repeated Kennedy, at once interested and turning a quick glance at me. I shrugged my shoulders in the negative. Neither the star nor any of the other papers had had a word about it. Why, what's the trouble? he continued to Miss Gray. You see, she explained, hurrying on, I'm Mr. Mansfield's private secretary, and oh, Professor Kennedy, I don't know, but I'm afraid it is a case for a detective rather than a doctor. She paused a moment and leaned forward nearer to us. I think he has been poisoned. The words themselves were startling enough without the evident perturbation of the girl. Whatever one might think, there was no doubt that she firmly believed what she professed to fear. More than that, I fancied I detected a deeper feeling in her tone than merely loyalty to her employer. Diamond Jack Mansfield was known in Wall Street as a successful promoter. On the white way as an assiduous first-nighter, in the sporting fraternity as a keen plunger. But of all his hobbies, none had gained him more notoriety than his veritable passion for collecting diamonds. He came by his sobriquet honestly. I remembered once having seen him, and he was, in fact, a walking De Beers mine. For his personal adornment, more than a million dollars' worth of gems did relay duty. He had scores of sets, every one of them fit for a king of diamonds. It was a curious hobby for a great strong man, yet he was not alone in his love of and sheer affection for things beautiful. Not love of display or desire to attract notice to himself had prompted him to collect diamonds, but the mere pleasure of owning them, of associating with them. It was his hobby. It was not strange, therefore, to suspect that Mansfield might, after all, have been the victim of some kind of attack. He went about with perfect freedom, in spite of the knowledge that Crooks must have possessed about his hoard. "'What makes you think he has been poisoned?' asked Kennedy, betraying no show of doubt that Miss Gray might be right. "'Oh, it's so strange, so sudden,' she murmured. "'But how do you think it could have happened?' he persisted. "'It must have been at the little supper party he gave at his apartment last night,' she answered thoughtfully then added more slowly, and yet it was not until this morning, eight or ten hours after the party, that he became ill. She shuddered. Paroxysms of nausea followed by stupor and such terrible prostration. His valet discovered him and sent for Dr. Murray, and then for me. How about the robbery, prompted Kennedy, as it became evident that it was Mansfield's physical condition more than anything else that was on Miss Gray's mind. Oh, yes, she recalled herself. I suppose you know something of his gems? Most people do. Kennedy nodded. He usually keeps them in a safe deposit vault downtown, 
from which he will get whatever set he feels like wearing. Last night it was the one he calls his sporting set that he wore, by far the finest. It cost over a hundred thousand dollars, and is one of the most curious of all the studies in personal adornment that he owns. All the stones are of the purest blue-white, and the set is entirely based on platinum. But what makes it most remarkable is that it contains the famous M-1273, as he calls it. The M stands for Mansfield, and the figures represent the number of stones he had purchased up to the time that he acquired this huge one. How could they have been taken, do you think? ventured Kennedy. Miss Gray shook her head doubtfully. I think the wall safe must have been opened somehow, she returned. Kennedy mechanically wrote the number M-1273 on a piece of paper. It has a weird history, she went on, observing what he had written, and this mammoth blue-white diamond in the ring is as blue as the famous Hope Diamond that has brought misfortune through half the world. This stone, they say, was pried from the mouth of a dying negro in South Africa. He had tried to smuggle it from the mine, and when he was caught, cursed the gem and every one who ever should own it. One owner in Amsterdam failed, another in Antwerp committed suicide. A Russian nobleman was banished to Siberia, and another went bankrupt and lost his home and family. Now, here it is in Mr. Mansfield's life. I, I hate it. I could not tell whether it was the superstition or the recent events themselves which weighed most in her mind. But at any rate, she resumed, somewhat bitterly a moment later, M-1273. M is the thirteenth letter of the alphabet, and 1273 add up to 13. The first and last numbers make 13, and John Mansfield has 13 letters in his name. I wish he had never worn the thing, never bought it. The more I listened to her, the more impressed I was with the fact that there was something more here than the feeling of a private secretary. Who were in the supper party? asked Kennedy. He gave it for Madeline Hargrave, the pretty little actress, you know, who took New York by storm last season in The Sport and his book next week to appear in the new show, The Astor Cup. Miss Grace said it, I thought, with a sort of wistful envy. Mansfield's gay little bohemian gatherings were well known. Though he was not young, he was still somewhat of a Lothario. Who else was there? asked Kennedy. Then there was Mina Leach, a member of Miss Hargrave's new company, she went on. Another was Fleming Lewis, the Wall Street broker. Dr. Murray and myself completed the party. Dr. Murray is his personal physician, ventured Craig. Yes. You know, when Mr. Mansfield's stomach went back on him last year, it was Dr. Murray who really cured him. Kennedy nodded. Might this present trouble be a recurrence of the old trouble? She shook her head. No, this is entirely different. Oh, I wish that you could go with me and see him, she pleaded. I will, agreed Kennedy. A moment later, we were speeding in a taxicab over to the apartment. Really, she remarked nervously, I feel lost with Mr. Mansfield so ill. He has so many interests downtown that require constant attention that just the loss of time means a great deal. Of course, I understand many of them, but you know a private secretary can't conduct a man's business. And just now, when I came up from the office, I couldn't believe that he was too ill to care about things until I actually saw him. We entered the apartment. A mere glance about showed that, even though Mansfield's hobby was diamonds, he was no mean collector of other articles of beauty. In the big living room, which was almost like a studio, we met a tall, spare, polished-mannered man whom I quickly recognized as Dr. Murray. "'Is he any better?' blurted out Miss Gray, even before our introductions were over. Dr. Murray shook his head gravely. "'About the same,' he answered, though one could find little reassurance in his tone. "'I should like to see him,' hinted Kennedy, unless there is some reason why I should not. No, replied the doctor absently. On the contrary, it might perhaps rouse him. He led the way down the hall, and Kennedy and I followed, while Miss Gray attempted to busy herself over some affairs at a huge mahogany table in the library just off the living room. Mansfield had shown the same love of luxury and the bazaar even in the furnishing of his bedroom, which was a black-and-white room with furniture of Chinese lacquer and teakwood. Kennedy looked at the veteran plunger long and thoughtfully as he lay stretched out, 
listless on the handsome bed. Mansfield seemed completely indifferent to our presence. There was something uncanny about him. Already his face was shrunken, his skin dark, and his eyes were hollow. "'What do you suppose it is?' asked Kennedy, bending over him and then rising and averting his head so that Mansfield could not hear, even if his vagrant faculty should be attracted. His pulse is terribly weak and his heart scarcely makes a sound. Dr. Murray's face knit in deep lines. "'I am afraid,' he said in a low tone, "'that I will have to admit not having been able to diagnose the trouble.' I was just considering whom I might call in. "'What have you done?' asked Kennedy, as the two moved a little farther out of earshot of the patient. "'Well,' replied the doctor slowly, when his valet called me in, "'I must admit that my first impression was that I had to deal with a case of diphtheria. I was so impressed that I even took a blood smear and examined it. It showed the presence of a tox albumin. But it isn't diphtheria. The antitoxin has no effect.' No, it isn't diphtheria, but the poison is there. I might have thought it was cholera, only that seems so impossible here in New York. Dr. Murray looked at Kennedy with no effort to conceal his perplexity. Over and over, I have asked myself what it could be, he went on. It seems to me that I have thought over about everything that is possible. Always I get back to the fact that there is that toxalbumin present. In some respects, it seems like the bite of a poisonous animal. There are no marks, of course, and it seems altogether impossible, yet it acts precisely as I have seen snake bites affect people. I am that desperate that I would try the Noguchi antivenin, but it would have no more effect than the antitoxin. No, I can only conclude that there is some narcotic irritant which especially affects the lungs and heart. Will you let me have one of the blood smears? asked Kennedy. Certainly, replied the doctor reaching over and taking a glass slide from several lying on a table. For some time after we left the sick room, Craig appeared to be considering what Dr. Murray had said. Seeking to find Miss Gray in the library, we found ourselves in the handsome, all-wood paneled dining room. It still showed evidences of the late banquet of the night before. Craig paused a moment in doubt which way to go, then picked up from the table a beautifully decorated menu card. As he ran his eye down it mechanically, he paused. Champignon, he remarked thoughtfully. Hmm, mushrooms. Instead of going on toward the library, he turned and passed through a swinging door into the kitchen. There was no one there, but it was in a much more upset condition than the dining room. Pardon, monsieur, sounded a voice behind us. It was the French chef who had entered from the direction of the servants' quarters, and was now all apologies for the untidy appearance of the realm over which he presided. The strain of the dinner had been too much for his assistance, he hastened to explain. "'I see that you had mushrooms, creamed,' remarked Kennedy. "'Oui, monsieur,' he replied, "'some that Miss Hargrave herself sent in from her mushroom cellar out in the country.' As he said it, his eye travelled involuntarily toward a pile of ramekins on a table. Kennedy noticed it and deliberately walked over to the table. Before I knew what he was about, he had scooped from them each a bit of the contents and placed it in some wax paper that was lying nearby. The chef watched him curiously. "'You would not find my kitchen like this ordinarily,' he remarked. "'I would not like to have Dr. Murray see it, for since last year, when Monsieur had the bad stomach, I have been very careful.' The chef seemed to be nervous. "'You prepared the mushrooms yourself?' asked Kennedy suddenly. "'I directed my assistant,' came back the wary reply but you know good mushrooms when you see them. Certainly, he replied quickly. There was no one else in the kitchen while you prepared them? Yes, he answered hurriedly. Mr. Mansfield came in and Miss Hargrave. Oh, they are very particular. And Dr. Murray, he has given me special orders ever since last year when Monsieur had the bad stomach, he repeated. Was anyone else here? Yes, I think so. You see, I am so excited. A big dinner. Such epicures. Everything must be just so. I cannot say. There seemed to be little satisfaction in quizzing the chef, and Kennedy turned again into the dining room, making his way back to the library, where Miss Gray was waiting anxiously for us. What do you think? she asked eagerly. I don't know what to think, replied Kennedy. No one else has felt any ill effects from the supper, I suppose? No, she replied, 
At least, I'm sure I would have heard by this time if they had. Do you recall anything peculiar about the mushrooms? shot out Kennedy. We talked about them some time, I remember, she said slowly. Growing mushrooms is one of Miss Hargrave's hobbies out at her place on Long Island. Yes, persisted Kennedy, but I mean anything peculiar about the preparation of them. Why, yes, she said suddenly. I believe that Miss Hargrave was to have superintended them herself. We all went out into the kitchen, but it was too late. They had been prepared already. You were in the kitchen? Yes, I remember. It was before the supper and just after we came in from the theater party which Mr. Mansfield gave. You know Mr. Mansfield is always doing unconventional things like that. If he took a notion, he would go into the kitchen of the Ritz. That is what I was trying to get out of the chef, Francois, remarked Kennedy. He didn't seem to have a very clear idea of what happened. I think I'll see him again, right away. We found the chef busily at work now, cleaning up. As Kennedy asked him a few inconsequential questions, his eye caught a row of books on a shelf. It was a most complete library of the culinary arts. Craig selected one and turned the pages over rapidly. Then he came back to the frontispiece, which showed a model dinner table set for a number of guests. He placed the picture before Francois, then withdrew it in, I should say, about ten seconds. It was a strange and incomprehensible action, but I was more surprised when Kennedy added, now tell me what you saw. Francois was quite overwhelming in his desire to please. Just what was going on in his mind I could not guess, nor did he betray it. But quickly he enumerated the objects on the table, gradually slowing up as the number which he recollected became exhausted. Were there candles? prompted Craig, as the flow of Francois's description ceased. Oh yes, candles, he agreed eagerly. Favors at each place? Yes, sir. I could see no sense in the proceeding, yet knew Kennedy too well to suppose for an instant that he had not some purpose. The questioning over, Kennedy withdrew, leaving poor Francois more mystified than ever. Well, I exclaimed, as we passed through the dining room, what was all that? That, he explained, is what is known to criminologists as the Osage test. Just try it some time when you get a chance. If there are, say, fifty objects in a picture, Normally a person may recall perhaps twenty of them. I see, I interrupted, a test of memory. More than that, he replied. You remember that, at the end, I suggested several things likely to be on the table. They were not there, as you may have seen if you had had the picture before you. That was a test of the susceptibility to suggestion of the chef. Francois may not mean to lie, but I am afraid we'll have to get along without him in getting to the bottom of the case. You see, before we go any further, we know that he is unreliable, to say the least. It may be that nothing at all happened in the kitchen to the mushrooms. We'll never discover it from him. We must get it elsewhere. Miss Gray had been trying to straighten out some of the snarls which Mansfield's business affairs had got into as a result of his illness, but it was evident that she had difficulty in keeping her mind on her work. The next thing I'd like to see, asked Kennedy, when we rejoined her, is that wall safe? She led the way down the hall and into an anteroom to Mansfield's part of the suite. The safe itself was a comparatively simple affair inside a closet. Indeed, I doubt whether it had been seriously designed to be burglar-proof. Rather, it was merely a protection against fire. Had you any suspicion about when the robbery took place? asked Kennedy, as we peered into the empty compartment. I wish I had been called in the first thing when it was discovered. There might have been some chance to discover fingerprints. But now, I suppose, every clue of that sort has been obliterated. No, she replied. I don't know whether it happened before or after Mr. Mansfield was discovered so ill by his valet. But at least you can give me some idea of when the jewels were placed in the safe. It must have been before the supper, right after our return from the theater. So, considered Kennedy then that would mean that they might have been taken by anyone, don't you see? Why did he place them in the safe so soon, instead of wearing them the rest of the evening? I hadn't thought of that way of looking at it, she admitted. Why, when we came home from the theater, I remember it had been so warm that Mr. Mansfield's collar was wilted and his dress shirt rumpled. He excused himself, and when he returned, he was not wearing the diamonds. We noticed it, 
and Miss Hargrave expressed her wish that she might wear the big diamond at the opening night of the Astor Cup. Mr. Mansfield promised that she might, and nothing more was said about it. "'Did you notice anything else at the dinner, no matter how trivial?' asked Kennedy. Helen Gray seemed to hesitate, then said, in a low voice, as though the words were wrung from her, "'Of course, the party and the supper were given ostensibly to Miss Hargrave, but lately I have thought he was paying quite as much attention to Mina Leach. It was quite in keeping with what we knew of Diamond Jack. Perhaps it was this seeming fickleness which had saved him from many entangling alliances. Miss Grace said it in such a way that it seemed like an apology for a fault in his character which she would rather have hidden. I could not but fancy that it mitigated somewhat the wistful envy I had noticed before when she spoke of Madeline Hargrave. While he had been questioning her, Kennedy had been examining the wall safe, particularly with reference to his successibility from the rest of the apartment. There appears to be no reason why one could not have got at it from the hallway as well as from Mansfield's room. The safe itself seemed to yield no clue, and Kennedy was about to turn away when he happened to glance down at the dark interior of the closet floor. He stooped down. When he rose, he had something in his hand. It was just a little thin piece of something that glittered iridescently. A spangle from a sequin dress, he muttered to himself, then turning to Miss Gray, did anyone wear such a dress last night? Helen Gray looked positively frightened. Miss Hargrave, she murmured simply. Oh, it cannot be. There must be some mistake. Just then we heard voices in the hall. But, Murray, I don't see why I can't see him, said one. What good will it do, Lewis, returned the other, which I recognize as that of Dr. Murray. Fleming Lewis, whispered Miss Gray, taking a step out into the hallway. A moment later, Dr. Murray and Lewis had joined us. I could see that there was some feeling between the two men, though what it was about I could not say. As Miss Gray introduced us, I glanced hastily out of the corner of my eye at Kennedy. Involuntarily, his hand which held the telltale sequin had sought his waistcoat pocket as though to hide it. Then I saw him check the action and deliberately examine the piece of tinsel between his thumb and forefinger. Dr. Murray saw it too, and his eyes were riveted on it, as though instantly he saw its significance. What do you think? Jack is sick as a dog and Rob too, and yet Murray says I oughtn't to see him, complained Lewis, for the moment oblivious to the fact that all our eyes were riveted on the spangle between Kennedy's fingers. And then slowly it seemed to dawn on him what it was. Madeline's, he exclaimed quickly. So Mina did tear it after all when she stepped on the train. Kennedy watched the faces before us keenly. No one said anything. It was evident that some such incident had happened, but had Lewis, with a quick flash of genius, sought to cover up something, protect somebody? Miss Gray was evidently anxious to transfer the scene at least to the living room, away from the sick room, and Kennedy, seeing it, fell in with the idea. Looks to me as though this robbery was an inside affair, remarked Lewis, as we all stood for a moment in the living room. Do you suppose one of the servants could have been planted for the purpose of pulling it off? The idea was plausible enough. Yet plausible as the suggestion might seem, it took no account of the other circumstances of the case. I could not believe that the illness of Mansfield was merely an unfortunate coincidence. Fleming Lewis's unguarded and blunt tendency to blurt out whatever seemed uppermost in his mind soon became a study to me as we talked together in the living room. I could not quite make out whether it was studied and astute or whether it was merely the natural exuberance of youth. There was certainly some sort of enmity between him and the doctor, which the remark about the spangle seemed to fan into a flame. Miss Gray maneuvered tactfully, however, to prevent a scene. And, after an interchange of remarks that threw more heat than light on the matter, Kennedy and I followed Lewis out to the elevator, with a parting promise to keep in touch with Miss Gray. What do you think of the spangle I queried of Craig as Lewis bade us a hasty goodbye and climbed into his car at the street entrance? Is it a clue or a stall? That remains to be seen, he replied noncommittally. Just now the thing that interests me most is what I can accomplish at the laboratory in the way of finding out what is the matter with Mansfield. While Kennedy was busy with the various solutions which he made of the contents of the ramekins that held the mushrooms, 
I wandered over to the university library and waded through several volumes on fungi, without learning anything of value. Finally, knowing that Kennedy would probably be busy for some time, and that all I should get for my pains by questioning him would be monosyllabic grunts until he was quite convinced that he was on the trail of something, I determined to run into the uptown office of the Star and talk over the affair as well as I could without violating what I felt had been given us in confidence. I could not, it turned out, have done anything better, for it seemed to be the gossip of the Broadway cafes and cabarets that Mansfield had been plunging rather deeply lately and had talked many of his acquaintances into joining him in a pool, either outright or on margins. It seemed to be a safe bet that not only Lewis and Dr. Murray had joined him, but that Madeline Hargrave and Mina Leach, who had had a successful season in some spare thousands to invest, might have gone in too. So far the fortunes of the stock market had not smiled on Mansfield's schemes, and I reflected it was not impossible that what might be merely an incident to a man like Mansfield could be very serious to the rest of them. It was the middle of the afternoon when I returned to the laboratory with my slender budget of news. Craig was quite interested in what I had to say, even pausing for a few moments in his work to listen. In several cages I saw that he had a number of little guinea pigs. One of them was plainly in distress, and Kennedy had been watching him intently. It's strange, he remarked. I had samples of material from six ramekins. Five of them seemed to have had no effect whatever. But if the bit that I gave this fellow causes such distress, what would a larger quantity do? Then one of the ramekins was poisoned? I questioned. I have discovered in it, as well as in the blood smear, the toxalbumin that Dr. Murray mentioned, he said simply, pulling out his watch. It isn't late. I think I shall have to take a trip out to Miss Hargrave's. We ought to do it in an hour and a half in a car. Kennedy said very little as we sped out over the Long Island rows that led to the little colony of actors and actresses at Cedar Grove. He seemed rather to be enjoying the chance to get away from the city and turn over in his mind the various problems which the case presented. As for myself, I had by this time convinced myself that somehow the mushrooms were involved. What Kennedy expected to find I could not guess. But from what I had read I surmised that it must be that one of the poisonous varieties had somehow got mixed with the others, one of the amanitas, just as deadly as the venom of the rattler or the copperhead. I knew that in some cases amanitas had been used to commit crimes. Was this such a case? We had no trouble in finding the estate of Miss Hargrave, and she was at home. Kennedy lost no time introducing himself and coming to the point of his visit. Madeline Hargrave was a slender, willowy type of girl, pronouncedly blonde, striking, precisely the type I should have imagined that Mansfield would have been proud to be seen with. I've just heard of Mr. Mansfield's illness, she said anxiously. Mr. Lewis called me up and told me. I don't see why Miss Gray or Dr. Murray didn't let me know sooner. She said it with an air of vexation, as though she felt slighted. In spite of her evident anxiety to know about the tragedy, however, I did not detect the depth of feeling that Helen Gray had shown. In fact, the thoughtfulness of Fleming Lewis almost led me to believe that it was he, rather than Mansfield, for whom she really cared. We chatted a few minutes, as Kennedy told what little we had discovered. He said nothing about the spangle. By the way, remarked Craig at length, I would very much like to have a look at that famous mushroom cellar of yours. For the first time she seemed momentarily to lose her poise. I've always had a great interest in mushrooms, she explained hastily. You, you do not think it could be the mushrooms that have caused Mr. Mansfield illness, do you? Kennedy passed off the remark as best he could under the circumstances. Though she was not satisfied with his answer, she could not very well refuse his request, and a few minutes later we were down in the dark dampness of the cellar back of the house, where Kennedy set to work on a most exhaustive search. I could see by the expression on his face, as the search progressed, that he was not finding what he had expected. Clearly the fungi before us were the common edible mushrooms. The upper side of each, as he examined it, was white with brownish fibrils or scales. Underneath, some were a beautiful salmon pink, changing gradually to almost black in the older specimens. The stem was colored like the top. 
but search as he might for what I knew he was after, in none did he find anything but a small or more often no swelling at the base, and no cup, as it is called. As he rose after his thorough search, I saw that he was completely baffled. I hardly thought you'd find anything, Miss Hargrave remarked, noticing the look on his face. I've always been very careful of my mushrooms. You have certainly succeeded admirably, he complimented. I hope you will let me know how Mr. Mansfield is, she said, as we started back toward our car on the road. I can't tell you how I feel. To think that, after a party which he gave for me, he should be taken ill, and not only that, but be robbed at the same time. Really, you must let me know, or I shall have to come up to the city. It seemed gratuitous for Kennedy to promise, for I knew that he was by no means through with her yet. But she thanked him, and we turned back toward town. Well, I remarked as we reeled off the miles quickly, I must say that that puts me all at sea again. I had convinced myself that it was a case of mushroom poisoning. What can you do now? Do? he echoed. Why, go on. This puts us a step nearer the truth, that's all. Far from being discouraged at what had seemed to me to be a fatal blow to the theory, he now seemed to be actually encouraged. Back in the city, he lost no time in getting to the laboratory again. A package from the botanical department of the university was waiting there for Kennedy, but before he could open it, the telephone buzzed furiously. I could gather from Kennedy's words that it was Helen Gray. I shall be over immediately, he promised, as he hung up the receiver and turned to me. Mansfield is much worse. Well, I get together some material I must take over there, Walter. I want you to call up Miss Hargrave and tell her to start for the city right away. Meet us at Mansfield's. Then get Mina Leach and Lewis. You'll find their numbers in the book, or else you'll have to get them from Miss Gray. While I was delivering the messages as diplomatically as possible, Kennedy had taken a vial from a medicine chest, and then from a cabinet a machine which seemed to consist of a number of collars and belts fastened to black cylinders from which ran tubes. An upright roll of ruled paper supported by a clockwork arrangement for revolving it, and a standard bearing a recording pen completed the outfit. I should much have preferred not to be hurried, he confessed, as we dashed over in the car to Mansfield's again, bearing the several packages. I wanted to have a chance to interview Mina Leach alone. However, it has now become a matter of life or death. Miss Gray was pale and worn as she met us in the living room. He's had a sinking spell, she said tremulously. Dr. Murray managed to bring him around, but he seems so much weaker after it. Another might... She broke off, unable to finish. A glance at Mansfield was enough to convince anyone that unless something was done soon, the end was not far. Another convulsion and sinking spell is about all he can stand, remarked Dr. Murray. May I try something? asked Kennedy, hardly waiting for the doctor to agree before he had pulled out the little vial which I had seen him place in his pocket. Deftly, Kennedy injected some of the contents into Mansfield's side, then stood anxiously watching the effect. The minutes lengthened. At least he seemed to be growing no worse. In the next room, on a table, Kennedy was now busy setting out the scroll of ruled paper and its clockwork arrangement, and connecting the various tubes from the black cylinders in such a way that the recording pen just barely touched on the scroll. He had come back to note the still unchanged condition of the patient when the door opened and a handsome woman in the early thirties entered, followed by Helen Gray. It was Mina Leach. Oh, isn't it terrible? I can hardly believe it, she cried, paying no attention to us as she moved over to Dr. Murray. I recalled what Miss Gray had said about Mansfield's attentions. It was evident that, as far as Mina was concerned, her own attentions were monopolized by the polished physician. His manner in greeting her told me that Dr. Murray appreciated it. Just then, Fleming Lewis bustled in. I thought Miss Hargrave was here, he said abruptly, looking about. They told me over the wire she would be. She should be here any moment, returned Kennedy, looking at his watch and finding that considerably over an hour had elapsed since I had telephoned. What it was I could not say, but there was a coldness toward Lewis that amounted to more than latent hostility. He tried to appear at ease, but it was a decided effort. There was no mistaking his relief when the tension was broken by the arrival of Madeline Hargrave. The circumstances were so strange that none of them seemed to object while Kennedy began to explain briefly that as nearly as he could determine, 
the illness of Mansfield might be due to something eaten at the supper. As he attached the bands about the necks and waists of one after another of the guests, bringing the little black cylinders thus close to the middle of their chests, he contrived to convey the impression that he would like to determine whether anyone else had been affected in a lesser degree. I watched most intently the two women who had just come in. One would certainly not have detected from their greeting and outward manner anything more than that they were well acquainted. But they were an interesting study, two quite opposite types. Madeline, with her baby blue eyes, was of the type that craved admiration. Mina's black eyes flashed now and then imperiously, as though she sought to compel what the others sought to win. As for Fleming Lewis, I could not fail to notice that he was most attentive to Madeline, though he watched furtively, but none the less keenly, every movement and word of Mina. His preparations completed, Kennedy opened the package which had been left at the laboratory just before the hasty call from Miss Gray. As he did so, he disclosed several specimens of a mushroom of pale lemon color with a center of deep orange, the top flecked with white bits. Underneath, the gills were white and the stem had a sort of veil about it. But what interested me most, and what I was looking for, was the remains of a sort of dirty chocolate-covered cup at the base of the stem. I suppose there is scarcely any need of saying, began Kennedy, that the food which I suspect in this case is the mushrooms. Here I have some which I have fortunately been able to obtain merely to illustrate what I am going to say. This is the deadly Amanita muscaria, the fly agaric. Madeline Hargrave seemed to be following him with a peculiar fascination. This Amanita, resumed Kennedy, has a long history, and I may say that few species are quite so interesting. Macerated in milk, it has been employed for centuries as a fly poison, hence its name. Its deadly properties were known to the ancients, and it is justly celebrated because of its long and distinguished list of victims. Agrippina used it to poison the Emperor Claudius. Among others, the Tsar Alexis of Russia died of eating it. I have heard that some people find it only a narcotic, and it is said that in Siberia there are actually Amanita debauchees who go on prolonged tears by eating the thing. It may be that it does not affect some people as it does others, but in most cases that beautiful gossamer veil which you see about the stem is really a shroud. The worst of it is, he continued, that this Amanita somewhat resembles the royal agaric, the Amanita Caesarea. It is, as you see, strikingly beautiful, and therefore all the more dangerous. He ceased a moment while we looked in a sort of awe at the fatally beautiful thing. It is not with the fungus that I am so much interested just now, however, Kennedy began again, but with the poison. Many years ago, scientists analyzed its poisonous alkaloids and found what they called bulbocene. Later it was named muscarin and is now sometimes known as amanitin, since it is confined to the mushrooms of the amananita genus. Amanitin is a wonderful and dangerous alkaloid which is absorbed in the intestinal canal. It is extremely violent. Three to five one-thousandths of a gram, or six one-hundredths of a grain, are very dangerous. More than that, the poisoning differs from most poisons in the long time that elapses between the taking of it and the first evidences of its effects. Muscarin, Kennedy concluded, has been chemically investigated more often than any other mushroom poison, and a perfect antidote has been discovered. Atropin, or belladonna, is such a drug. For a moment I looked about at the others in the room. Had it been an accident, after all? Perhaps, if any of the others had been attacked, one might have suspected that it was. But they had not been affected at all, at least apparently. Yet there could be no doubt that it was the poisonous muscarin that had affected Mansfield. Did you ever say anything like that? asked Kennedy suddenly, holding up the gilt spangle which he had found on the closet floor near the wall safe. Though no one said a word, it was evident that they all recognized it. Lewis was watching Madeline closely, but she betrayed nothing except mild surprise at seeing the spangle from her dress. Had it been deliberately placed there, it flashed over me, in order to compromise Madeline Hargrave and divert suspicion from someone else. I turned to Mina. Behind the defiance of her dark eyes I felt that there was something working. Kennedy must have sensed that even before I did for he suddenly bent down over the recording needle and the ruled paper on the table. This, he shot out, is a pneumograph which shows the actual intensity of the emotions by recording their effects on the heart and lungs together. 
the truth can literally be tapped, even where no confession can be extracted. A moment's glance at this line, traced here by each of you, can tell the expert more than words. Then it was a mushroom that poisoned Jack, interrupted Lewis suddenly. Some poisonous amanita got mixed with the edible mushrooms? Kennedy answered quickly without taking his eyes off the line the needle was tracing. No, this was a case of the deliberate use of the active principle itself, muscarine, with the expectation that the death, if the cause was ever discovered, could easily be blamed on such a mushroom. Somehow, there were many chances, the poison was slipped into the ramekin Francois was carefully preparing for Mansfield. The method does not interest me so much as the fact. There was a slight noise from the other room where Mansfield lay. Instantly we were all on our feet. Before any of us could reach the door, Helen Gray had slipped through it. Just a second, commanded Kennedy, extending the sequin towards us to emphasize what he was about to say. The poisoning and the robbery were the work of one hand. That sequin is the key that has unlocked the secret which my pneumograph has recorded. Someone saw that robbery committed, knew nothing of the contemplated poisoning to cover it. To save the reputation of the robber, at any cost, on the spur of the moment the ruse of placing the sequin in the closet occurred. Madeline Hargrave turned to Mina, while I recalled Lewis's remark about Mina stepping on the train and tearing it. The defiance in her black eyes flashed from Madeline to Kennedy. Yes, she cried. I did it. I... As quickly the defiance had faded, Mina Leach had fainted. Some water! Quick! cried Kennedy. I sprang through the door into Mansfield's room. As I passed, I caught sight of Helen Gray supporting the head of Mansfield, both oblivious to actresses, diamonds, everything that had so nearly caused a tragedy. No, I heard Kennedy say to Lewis as I returned, it was not Mina. The person she shielded was wildly in love with her, insanely jealous of Mansfield for even looking at her, and in debt so hopelessly in Mansfield's ventures that only the big diamond could save him. Dr. Murray himself. End of chapter 2「Three of the Treasure Train » by Arthur B. Reeve This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Soul Analysis Here's the most remarkable appeal, observed Kennedy, one morning, as he tossed over to me a letter. What do you make of that? It read, Montrose, Connecticut. My dear Professor Kennedy, you do not know me, but I have heard a great deal about you. Please, I beg of you, do not disregard this letter. At least try to verify the appeal I am making. I am here at the Belle Claire Sanatorium, run by Dr. Bolton Burr in Montrose. But it is not a real sanatorium. It is really a private asylum. Let me tell my story briefly. After my baby was born, I devoted myself to it. But in spite of everything, it died. Meanwhile, my husband neglected me terribly. After the baby's death I was a nervous wreck, and I came up here to rest. Now I find I am being held here as an insane patient. I cannot get out. I do not even know whether this letter will reach you. But the chambermaid here has told me she will post it for me. I am ill and nervous, a wreck, but not insane, although they will tell you that the twilight sleep treatment affected my mind. But what is happening here will eventually drive me insane if someone does not come to my rescue. Cannot you get in to see me as a doctor or friend? I will leave all to you after that. Yours anxiously, Janet, Mrs. Roger, Cranston. What do you make of it yourself? I returned, handing back the letter. Are you going to take it up? He slowly looked over the letter again. Judging by the handwriting, he remarked thoughtfully, I should say that the writer is laboring under keen excitement though there is no evidence of insanity on the face of it. Yes, I think I will take up the case. But how are you going to get in, I asked. They'll never admit you willingly. Kennedy pondered a minute. I'll get in all right, he said at length. Come on, I'm going to call on Roger Cranston first. Roger Cranston? I repeated dumbfounded. Why, he'll never help you. Ten to one, he's in on it. We'll have to take that chance, returned Kennedy, hurrying me out of the laboratory. Roger Cranston was a well-known lawyer and man about town, 
We found him in his office on Lower Broadway. He was young and distinguished-looking, which probably accounted for the fact that his office had become a sort of fashionable court of domestic relations. I am a friend of Dr. Bolton Burr of Montrose, introduced Kennedy. Cranston looked at him keenly, but Kennedy was a good actor. I have been studying some of the patients at the sanatorium, and I have seen Mrs. Cranston there. Indeed, responded Cranston. I am all broken up by it myself. I could not resist thinking that he took it very calmly, however. I should like very much to make what we call a psychoanalysis of Mr. Cranston's mental condition, Kennedy explained. A psychoanalysis? repeated Cranston. Yes, you know, it is a new system. In the field of abnormal psychology, the soul analysis is of first importance. Today, this study is one of the greatest help in neurology and psychiatry. Only I can't make it without the consent of the natural guardian of the patient. Dr. Burr tells me that you will have no objection. Cranston thoughtfully studied the wall opposite. Well, he returned slowly, they tell me that without treatment she will soon be hopelessly insane, perhaps dangerously so. That is all I know. I am not a specialist. If Dr. Burr... He paused. If you can give me just a card, urged Kennedy, that is all Dr. Burr wishes. Cranston wrote hastily on the back of one of his cards what Kennedy dictated. Please allow Dr. Kennedy to make a psychoanalysis of my wife's mental condition. You will let me know if there is any hope? he asked. As soon as I can, replied Kennedy. I will let you have a copy of my report. Cranston thanked us and bowed us to the door suavely. Well, I remarked, as we rode down in the elevator, that was clever. He fell for it, too. You're an artist. Do you think he was posing? Kennedy shrugged his shoulders. We lost no time in getting the first train for Montrose before Cranston had time to reconsider and call up Dr. Burr. The Belclair Sanatorium was on the outskirts of the town. It was an old stone house, rather dingy, and surrounded by a high stone wall surmounted by sharp pickets. Dr. Bolton Burr, who was at the head of the institution, met us in the plainly furnished reception room, which also served as his office. Through a window we could see some of the patients, walking or sitting about on a small stretch of scraggly grass between the house and the wall. Dr. Burr was a tall and commanding-looking man with a Van Dyke beard, and one would instinctively have picked him out anywhere as a physician. "'I believe you have a patient here, Mrs. Roger Cranston,' began Kennedy, after the usual formalities. Dr. Burr eyed us askance. "'I've been asked by Mr. Cranston to make an examination of his wife,' pursued Craig, presenting the card which he had obtained from Roger Cranston. "'Hm,' mused Dr. Burr looking quickly from the card to Kennedy with a searching glance. "'I wish you would tell me something of the case before I see her,' went on Kennedy with absolute assurance. "'Well,' temporized Dr. Burr, twirling the card, "'Mrs. Cranston came to me after the death of her child. She was in a terrible state. But we are slowly building up her shattered nerves by plain, simple living and a tonic.' "'Was she committed by her husband?' queried Kennedy unexpectedly. Whether or not Dr. Burr felt suspicious of us I could not tell, but he seemed eager to justify himself. I have the papers committing her to my care, he said, rising and opening a safe in the corner. He laid before us a document in which appeared the names of Roger Cranston and Julia Giles. Who is this Julia Giles? asked Kennedy, after he had read the document. One of our nurses, returned the doctor. She has had Mrs. Cranston under observation ever since she arrived. I should like to see both Miss Giles and Mrs. Cranston, insisted Kennedy. It is not that Mr. Cranston is in any way dissatisfied with your treatment, but he thought that perhaps I might be of some assistance to you. Kennedy's matter was ingratiating but firm, and he hurried on, lest it should occur to Dr. Burr to call up Cranston. The doctor, still twirling the card, finally led us through the wide central hall and up an old-fashioned winding staircase to a large room on the second floor. He tapped at the door, which was open, disclosing an interior tastefully furnished. Dr. Burr introduced us to Miss Giles, conveying the impression which Kennedy had already given that he was a specialist and I his assistant. Janet Cranston was a young and also remarkably beautiful girl. One could see traces of sorrow in her face, which was exceedingly, though not unpleasingly, pale. 
the restless brilliancy of her eyes spoke of some physical, if not psychical, disorder. She was dressed in deep mourning, which heightened her pallor and excited a feeling of mingled respect and interest. Thick brown coils of chestnut hair were arranged in such a manner as to give an extremely youthful appearance to her delicate face. Her emotions were expressed by the constant motion of her slender fingers. Miss Giles was a striking woman of an entirely different type. She seemed to be exuberant with health, as though nursing had taught her not merely how to take care of others, but had given her the secret of caring, first of all, for herself. I could see as Dr. Burr introduced us to his patient that Mrs. Cranston instantly recognized Kennedy's interest in her case. She received us with graceful courtesy, but she betrayed no undue interest that might excite suspicion, nor was there any hint of giving the note of appeal. I wondered whether that might not be an instance of the cunning for which I had heard that the insane are noted. She showed no sign of insanity, however. I looked about curiously to see if there were evidences of the treatment which she was receiving. On a table stood a bottle and a glass, as well as a teaspoon, and I recalled the doctor's remark about the tonic. "'You look tired, Mrs. Cranston,' remarked Kennedy thoughtfully. "'Why not rest while we are here, and then I will be sure my visit has had no ill effects?' "'Thank you,' she murmured, and I was much impressed by the sweetness of her voice. As he spoke, Kennedy arranged the pillows on a chaise lounge and placed her on it with her head slightly elevated. Having discussed the subject of psychoanalysis with Kennedy before, I knew that this was so that nothing might distract her from the free association of ideas. He placed himself near her head and motioned to us to stand farther back of him where she could not see us. Avoid all muscular exertion and distraction, he continued. I want you to concentrate your attention thoroughly. Tell me anything that comes into your mind. Tell all you know of your symptoms. Concentrate and repeat all you think of. Frankly express all the thoughts that you have, even though they may be painful and embarrassing. He said this soothingly and she seemed to understand that much depended upon her answers and the fact of not forcing her ideas. "'I am thinking of my husband,' Mrs. Cranston began finally, in a dreamy tone. "'What of him?' suggested Kennedy. "'Of how the baby separated us, and—' she paused almost in tears. "'From what I knew of the method of psychoanalysis, I recalled it was the gaps and hesitations—' which were most important in arriving at the truth regarding the cause of her trouble. Perhaps it was my fault. Perhaps I was a better mother than wife. I thought I was doing what he would want me to do. Too late I see my mistake. It was easy to read into her story that there had been other women in his life. It had wounded her deeply. Yet it was equally plain that she still loved him. Go on, urged Kennedy gently. Oh, yes, she resumed dreamily. I am thinking about once when I left him, I wandered through the country. I remember a little except that it was the country through which we had passed on an automobile trip on our honeymoon. Once I thought I saw him, and I tried to get to him. I longed for him, but each time, when I almost reached him, he would disappear. I seemed to be so deserted and alone. I tried to call him, but my tongue refused to say his name. It must have been hours that I wandered about, for I recall nothing after that until I was found, disheveled and exhausted. She paused and closed her eyes, while I could see that Kennedy considered this gap very important. Don't stop, persisted Kennedy. Once we quarreled over one of his clients who was suing for a divorce. I thought he was devoting too much time and attention to her. While there might not have been anything wrong, still I was afraid. In my anger and anxiety I accused him. He retorted by slamming the door, and I did not see him for two or three days. I realized my nervous condition, and one day a mutual friend of ours introduced me to Dr. Burr and advised me to take a rest cure at his sanatorium. By this time Roger and I were on speaking terms again, but the death of the baby and the quarrel left me still as nervous as before. He seemed anxious to have me do something, and so I came here. Do you remember anything that happened after that? asked Craig, for the first time asking a mildly leading question. Yes, I recall everything that happened when I came here, she went on. Roger came up with me to complete the necessary arrangements. 
We were met at the station by Dr. Burr and this woman, who has since been my nursing companion. On the way up from the station to the sanatorium, Dr. Burr was very considerate of me, and I noticed that my husband seemed interested in Miss Giles and the care she was to take of me. Kennedy flashed a glance at me from a notebook in which he was apparently busily engaged in jotting down her answers. I did not know just what interpretation to put on it, but surmised that it meant that he had struck what the new psychologist called a complex in the entrance of Miss Giles into the case. Before we realized it, there came a sudden outburst of feeling. And now, they are keeping me here by force, she cried. Dr. Burr looked at us significantly, as much as to say, just what might be expected, you see. Kennedy nodded, but made no effort to stop Mrs. Cranston. They have told Roger that I am insane, and I know he must believe it or he would not leave me here. But their real motive, I can guess, is mercenary. I can't complain about my treatment here. It costs enough. By this time she was sitting bolt upright, staring straight ahead as though amazed at her own boldness and speaking so frankly before them. I feel all right at times, then it is as though I had a paralysis of the body, but not of the mind, not of the mind, she repeated tensely. There was a frightened look on her face, and her voice was now wildly appealing. What would have followed I cannot guess, for at this instant there came a noise outside from another of the rooms, as though pandemonium had broken loose. By the shouting and confusion, one might easily have wondered whether keepers and lunatics might not have exchanged places. It is just one of the patients who has escaped from his room, explained Dr. Burr, nothing to be alarmed about. We'll soon have him quieted. Dr. Burr hurried out into the corridor while Miss Giles was looking out of the door. Quickly, Kennedy reached over and abstracted several drops from a bottle of tonic on the table, pouring it into his handkerchief, which he rolled up tightly and stuffed into his pocket. Mrs. Cranston watched him pleadingly and clasped her hands in mute appeal with a hasty glance at Miss Giles. Kennedy said nothing either, but rapidly folded up a page of the notebook on which he had been writing and shoved it into Mrs. Cranston's hand, together with something he had taken from his pocket. She understood and quickly placed it in her corsage. Read it when you are absolutely alone, he whispered just as Miss Giles shut the door and turned to us. The excitement subsided almost as quickly as it had arisen, but it had been sufficient to put a stop to any further study of the case along those lines. Miss Giles' keen eyes missed no action or movement of her patient. Dr. Burr returned shortly. It was evident from his manner that he wished to have the visit terminated, and Kennedy seemed quite willing to take the hint. He thanked Mrs. Cranston, and we withdrew quietly after bidding her goodbye in a manner as reassuring as we could make it under the circumstances. You see, remarked Dr. Burr as we walked down the hall, she is quite unstrung still. Mr. Cranston comes up here once in a while, and we notice that after these visits she is, if anything, worse. Down the hall the door had been left open, and we could catch a glimpse of a patient rolled in a blanket while two nurses forced something down his throat. Dr. Burr hastily closed the door as we passed. That is the condition Mrs. Cranston might have got into if she had not come to us when she did, he said. As it is, she is never violent and is one of the most tractable patients we have. We left shortly, without finding out whether Dr. Burr suspected us of anything or not. As we made our way back to the city, I could not help the feeling of depression such as Poe mentioned at seeing the private madhouse in France. That glimpse we had into the other room almost makes one recall the soothing system of Dr. Maillard. Is Dr. Burr's system better? I ask. A good deal of what we used to think and practice is out of date now, returned Kennedy. I think you are already familiar with the theory of dreams that has been developed by Dr. Sigmund Freud of Vienna. But perhaps you are not aware of the fact that Freud's contribution to the study of insanity is of even greater scientific value than his dream theories taken by themselves. Hers, I feel sure now, is what is known as one of the so-called borderline cases, he continued. It is clearly a case of hysteria, not the hysteria one hears spoken of commonly, but the condition which scientists know as such. We trace the impulses from which hysterical conditions arise, penetrate the disguises which these repressed impulses or wishes must assume in order to appear in the consciousness. 
Such transformed impulses are found in normal people, too, sometimes. The hysteric suffers mostly from reminiscences which, paradoxically, may be completely forgotten. Obsessions and phobias have their origin, according to Freud, in sexual life. The obsession represents a compensation or substitute for an unbearable sexual idea and takes its place in consciousness. In normal sexual life, no neurosis is possible, say the Freudists. Sex is the strongest impulse, yet subject to the greatest repression, and hence the weakest point of our cultural development. Hysteria arises through the conflict between libido and sex repression. Often, sex wishes may be consciously rejected but unconsciously accepted. So when they are understood, every insane utterance has a reason. There is really method in madness. When hysteria in a wife gains her the attention of an otherwise inattentive husband, it fills, from the standpoint of her deeper longing, an important place, and in a sense may be said to be desirable. The great point about the psychoanalytic method, as discovered by Breuer and Freud, is that certain symptoms of hysteria disappear when the hidden causes are brought to light and the repressed desires are gratified. How does that apply to Mrs. Cranston? I queried. Mrs. Cranston, he replied, is suffering from what the psychoanalysts call a psychic trauma, a soul wound, as it were. It is the neglect in this case of her husband, whom she deeply loves. That in itself is sufficient to explain her experience wandering through the country. It was the region which she associated with her first love affair, as she told us. The wave of recollection that swept over her engulfed her mind. In other words, reason could no longer dominate the cravings for a love so long suppressed. Then, when she saw, or imagined she saw, one who looked like her lover, the strain was too great. It was the middle of the afternoon when we reached the laboratory. Kennedy at once set to work studying the drops of tonic which had been absorbed in the handkerchief. As Kennedy worked, I began thinking over again of what we had seen at the Belclair Sanatorium. Somehow or other, I could not get out of my mind the recollection of the man rolled in the blanket and trussed up as helpless as a mummy. I wondered whether that alone was sufficient to account for the quickness with which he had been pacified. Then I recalled Mrs. Cranston's remark about her mental alertness and physical weakness. Had it anything to do with the tonic? Suppose, while I am waiting, I finally suggested to Craig, I try to find out what Cranston does with his time since his wife has been shut off from the world. That's a very good idea, acquiesced Kennedy. Don't take too long, however, for I may strike something important here any minute. After several inquiries over the telephone, I found that since his wife had been in Montrose, Cranston had closed his apartment and was living at one of his clubs. Having two or three friends who were members, I did not hesitate to drop around. Unfortunately, none of my friends happened to be there, and I was forced, finally, to ask for Cranston himself, although all that I really wanted to know was whether he was there or not. One of the clerks told me that he had been in, but had left in a taxicab only a short time before. As there was a cab stand outside the club, I determined to make an inquiry and perhaps discover the driver who had had him. The starter knew him, and when I said that it was very important business on which I wanted to see him, he motioned to a driver who had just pulled up. A chance for another fare and a generous tip were all that was necessary to induce him to drive me to Trocadero, a fashionable restaurant and cabaret where he had taken Cranston a short time before. It was crowded when I entered, and avoiding the head waiter, I stood by the door a few minutes and looked over the brilliant and gay throng. Finally, I managed to catch a glimpse of Cranston's head at a table in a far corner. As I made my way down the line of tables, I was genuinely amazed to see that he was with a woman. It was Julia Giles. She must have come down on the train after we did, but at any rate, it looked as though she had lost no time in seeking out Cranston after our visit. I took a seat at a table next to them. They were talking about Kennedy, and during a lull in the music, I overheard him asking her what Craig had done. It was certainly very clever in him to play both you and Dr. Burr the way he did. He told Dr. Burr that you had sent him, and told you that Dr. Burr had sent him. By whom do you suppose he really was sent? Could it have been my wife? It must have been, but how she did it is more than I can imagine. How was she anyway? he asked. 
Sometimes she seems to be getting along finely, and then other days I feel quite discouraged about her. Her case is very obstinate. Perhaps I had better go out and see Burr, he considered. It is early in the evening. I'll drive you out in my car. I'll stay at the sanatorium tonight, and then perhaps I'll know a little better what we can do. It was his tone rather than his words which gave me the impression that he was more interested in being with Miss Giles than with Mrs. Cranston. I wondered whether it was a plot of Cranston's and Miss Giles. Had he been posing before Kennedy, and were they really trying to put Mrs. Cranston out of the way? As the music started up again, I heard her say, Can't we have just one more dance? A moment later they were lost in the gay whirl on the dancing floor. They made a handsome couple, and it was evident that it was not the first time that they had dined and danced together. The music ceased, and they returned to their places reluctantly, while Cranston telephoned for his car to be brought around to the cabaret. I hastened back to the laboratory to inform Craig what I had seen. As I told my story, he looked up at me with a sudden flash of comprehension. I am glad to know where they will all be tonight, he said. Someone has given her henbane, Hyoskyamen. I have just discovered it in the tonic. What's henbane? I asked. It is a drug derived from the Hyosychamus plant, much like belladonna, though more distinctly sedative. It is a hypnotic used often in mania and mental excitement. The feeling which Mrs. Cranston describes is one of its effects. You recall the brightness of her eyes? That is one of the effects of mydriatic alkaloids, of which this is one. The ancients were familiar with several of its peculiar properties, as they knew of the closely allied poison hemlock. Many of the textbooks at the present time fail to say anything about the remarkable effect produced by large doses of this terrible alkaloid. This effect can be described technically so as to be intelligible, but no description can convey even approximately the terrible sensation produced in many insane patients by large doses. In a general way, it is the condition of paralysis of the body without corresponding paralysis of the mind. And is this stuff that somebody has been putting into her tonic? I asked, startled. Do you suppose that it is part of Burr's system, or did Miss Giles lighten her work by putting it into the tonic? Kennedy did not betray his suspicion, but went on describing the drug which was having such a serious effect on Mrs. Cranston. The victim lies in an absolutely helpless condition, sometimes with his muscles so completely paralyzed that he can not so much as move a finger, cannot close his lips or move his tongue to moisten them. This feeling of helplessness is usually followed by unconsciousness, and then by a period of depression. This combined feeling of helplessness and depression is absolutely unlike any other feeling imaginable, if I may judge from the accounts of those who have experienced it. Other sensations, such as pain, may be judged in a measure by comparison with other painful sensations, but the sensation produced by hyoskyamin in large doses seems to have no basis for comparison. There is no kindred feeling. Practically every institution for the insane used it a few years ago for controlling patients, but now better methods have been devised. The more I think of what I saw at the Trocadero, I remarked, the more I wonder if Miss Giles has been seeking to win Cranston herself. In large doses and repeated often enough, continued Kennedy, I suppose the toxic effect of the drug might be to produce insanity. At any rate, if we are going to do anything, it might be better done at once. They are all out there now. If we act tonight, surely we shall have the best chance of making the guilty person betray himself. Kennedy telephoned for a fast touring car, and in half an hour, while he gathered some apparatus together, the car was before the door. In it he placed a couple of light silk rope ladders, some common wooden wedges, and an instrument which resembled the surveyor's transit, with two conical horns sticking out at the ends. We made the trip out of New York and up the Boston Post Road, following the route which Cranston and Miss Giles must have taken some hours before us. In the town of Montrose, Kennedy stopped only long enough to get a bite to eat and to study up in the roads in the vicinity. It was long after midnight when we struck up into the country. The night was very dark, thick and foggy. With the engine running as muffled as possible and the lights dimmed, Kennedy quietly jammed on the brakes as we pulled up along the side of the road. 
A few rods farther ahead I could make out the Belclair Sanatorium, surrounded by its picketed stone wall. Not a light was visible in any of the windows. Now that we're here, I whispered, what can we do? You remember the paper I gave Mrs. Cranston when the excitement in the hall broke loose? Yes, I nodded, as we moved over under the shadow of the wall. I wrote on a sheet from my notebook, said Kennedy, and told her to be ready when she heard a pebble strike the window, and I gave her a piece of string to let down to the ground. Kennedy threw the silk ladder up until it caught on one of the pickets. Then, with the other ladder and the wedges, he reached the top of the wall, followed by me. We pulled the first ladder up as we clung to the pickets and let it down again inside. Noiselessly, we crossed the lawn. Above was Mrs. Cranston's window. Craig picked up some bits of broken stone from a walk about the house and threw them gently against the pane. Then we drew back into the shadow of the house, lest any prying eyes might discover us. In a few minutes the window on the second floor was stealthily opened. The muffled figure of Mrs. Cranston appeared in the dim light, then a piece of string was lowered. To it, Kennedy attached a light silk ladder and motioned in pantomime for her to draw it up. It took some time to fasten the ladder to one of the heavy pieces of furniture in the room. Swaying from side to side, but clinging with frantic desperation to the ladder while we did our best to steady it, she managed to reach the ground. She turned from the building with a shudder and whispered, This terrible place! How can I ever thank you for getting me out of it? Kennedy did not pause long enough to say a word, but hurried her across to the final barrier, the wall. Suddenly there was a shout of alarm from the front of the house under the columns. It was the night watchman who had discovered us. Instantly Kennedy seized a chair from a little summer house. Quick, Walter, he cried. Over the wall with Mrs. Cranston while I hold him. Then throw the ladder back on this side. I'll join you in a minute as soon as you get her safely over. A chair is only an indifferent club, if that is all one can think of using it for. Kennedy ran squarely at the watchman, holding it straight before him. Only once did I cast a hasty glance back. There was the man pinned to the wall by the chair, with Kennedy at the other end of it and safely out of reach. Mrs. Cranston and I managed to scramble over the wall, although she tore her dress on the pickets before we reached the other side. I hustled her into the car and made everything ready to start. It was only a couple of minutes after I threw the ladder back before Craig rejoined us. How did you get away from the watchman? I demanded breathlessly as we shot away. I forced him back with the chair into the hall and slammed the door. Then I jammed a wedge under it, he chuckled. That will hold it better than any lock. Every push will jam it tighter. Above the hubbub, inside now, we could hear a loud gong sounding insistently. All about were lights flashing up at the windows and moving through the passageways. Shouts came from the back of the house as a door was finally opened there. But we were off now, with a good start. I could imagine the frantic telephoning that was going on in the sanatorium, and I knew that the local police of Montrose and every other town about us were being informed of the escape. They were required by the law to render all possible assistance, and as the country boasted several institutions quite on par with Belle Claire, an attempt at an escape was not an unusual occurrence. The post road by which we had come was therefore impossible, and Kennedy swung up into the country in the hope of throwing off pursuit long enough to give us a better chance. Take the wheel, Walter, he muttered. I'll tell you what turns to make. We must get to the state line of New York without being stopped. We can beat almost any car, but that is not enough. A telephone message ahead may stop us unless we can keep from being seen. I took the wheel and did not stop the car as Kennedy climbed over the seat. In the back of the car, where Mrs. Cranston was sitting, he hastily adjusted the peculiar apparatus. Sounds at night are very hard to locate, he explained. Up this side road, Walter, there is someone coming ahead of us. I turned and shot up the detour, stopping in the shadow of some trees, where we switched off every light and shut down the engine. Kennedy continued to watch the instrument before him. What is it? I whispered. A phenometer, he replied. It was invented to measure the intensity of sound, but it is much more valuable as an instrument that tells with precision from which direction sound comes. It needs only a small dry battery and can be carried around easily. The sound enters the two horns of the phenometer 
is focused at the neck and strikes on a delicate diaphragm behind which is a needle. The diaphragm vibrates and the needle moves. The louder the sound, the greater the movement of this needle. At this end, where it looks as though I were sighting like a surveyor, I am gazing into a lens with a tiny electric bulb close to my eye. The light of this bulb is reflected in a mirror which is moved by the moving needle. When the sound is loudest, the two horns are at right angles to the direction whence it comes. So it is only necessary to twist the phenomenon about on its pivot until the sound is received most loudly in the horns, and the band of light is greatest. I know then that the horns are at right angles to the direction from which the sound proceeds, and that, as I lift my head, I am looking straight toward the source of the sound. I can tell its direction to a few degrees. I looked through it myself to see how sound was visualized by light. Hush, cautioned Kennedy. Down on the main road we could see a car pass along slowly in the direction of Montrose from which we had come. Without the phenomena to warn us, it must inevitably have met us and blocked our escape over the road ahead. That danger passed, on we sped. Five minutes, I calculated, and we should cross the state line to New York in safety. We had been going along nicely when, bang, came a loud report back of us. Confound it, muttered Kennedy. A blowout always when you least expect it. We climbed out of the car and had the shoe off in short order. Look, cried Janet Cranston, in a frightened voice from the back of the car. The light of the phenomena had flashed up. A car was following us. There's just one chance, cried Kennedy, springing to the wheel. We might make it on the rim. Banging and pounding, we forged ahead, straining our eyes to watch the road, the distance, the time, and the phenomena all at once. It was no use. A big gray roadster was overtaking us. The driver crowded us over to the very edge of the road, then shot ahead, and where the road narrowed down, deliberately pulled up across the road in such a way that we had to run into him or stop. Quickly, Craig's automatic gleamed in the dim lights from the sidelights. Just a minute, cautioned the voice. It was a plot against me, quite as much as it was against her, the nurse to lead me on while the doctor got a rich patient. I suspect it all was not right. That's why I gave you the card. I knew you didn't come from Burr. Then, when I heard nothing from you, I let the Giles woman think I was coming to Montrose to be with her. But really, I wanted to beat that fake asylum. Two piercing headlights shone down the road back of us. We waited a moment until they, too, came to a stop. Here they are, shouted the voice of a man, as he jumped out, followed by a woman. Kennedy stepped forward, waving his automatic menacingly. You are under arrest for conspiracy, both of you, he cried, as we recognized Dr. Burr and Miss Giles. A little cry behind me startled me, and I turned. Janet Cranston had flung herself into the arms of the only person who could heal her wounded soul. End of Chapter 3《Chapter Four of the Treasure Train》by Arthur B. Reeve. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Mystic Poisoner. It's almost as though he had been struck down by a spirit hand, Kennedy. Grady, the house detective of the Prince Edward Charles Hotel, had routed us out of bed in the middle of the night with a hurried call for help, and now met us in the lobby of the fashionable hostelry. All that he had said over the wire was that there had been a murder, an Englishman, a Captain Shirley. Why, exclaimed Grady, lowering his voice as he led us through the lobby, it's the most mysterious thing, I think, that I have ever seen. In what way? prompted Kennedy. Well, continued Grady, it must have been just a bit after midnight that one of the elevator boys heard what sounded like a muffled report in a room on the tenth floor. There were other employees and some guests about at the time and it was only a matter of seconds before they were on the spot. Finally, the sound was located as having come probably from Captain Shirley's room. But the door was locked, on the inside. There was no response, although someone had seen him ride up in the elevator scarcely five minutes before. By that time they had sent for me. We broke in. There was Shirley, alone, fully dressed, lying on the floor before a writing table. His face was horribly set as though he had perhaps seen something that frightened and haunted him. 
though I suppose it might have been the pain that did it. I think he must have heard something, jumped from the chair, perhaps in fear, then have fallen down on the floor almost immediately. We hurried over to him. He was still alive, but could not speak. I turned him over, tried to rouse him and make him comfortable. It was only then that I saw that he was really conscious. But it seemed as if his tongue and most of his muscles were paralyzed. Somehow he had managed to convey to us the idea that it was his heart that troubled him most. Really, at first I thought it was a case of suicide. But there was no sign of a weapon about and not a trace of poison, no glass, no packet. There was no wound on him either, except a few slight cuts and scratches on his face and hands. But none of them looked to be serious. And yet, before we could get the house physician up to him, he was dead. And with not a word, queried Kennedy. That's the strangest part of it. No, not a word spoken. But as he lay there, even in spite of his paralyzed muscles, he was just able to motion with his hands. I thought he wanted to write, and gave him a pencil and a piece of paper. He clutched at them, but here is all he was able to do. Grady drew from his pocket a piece of paper and handed it to us. On it were printed in trembling irregular characters, G.A.D., the D scarcely finished and trailing off into nothing. What did it all mean? How had Shirley met his death, and why? Tell me something about him, said Kennedy, studying the paper with a frown. Grady shrugged his shoulders. An Englishman. That's about all I know. Look like one of the younger sons who so frequently go out to seek their fortunes in the colonies. By his appearance I should say that he had been in the Far East, India, no doubt. And I imagine he had made good. He seemed to have plenty of money. That's all I know about him. Is anything missing from his room? I asked. Could it have been a robbery? I searched the room hastily, replied Grady. Apparently not a thing had been touched. I don't think it was a robbery. By this time we had made our way through the lobby and were in the elevator. I've kept the room just as it was, went on Grady to Kennedy, lowering his voice. I've even delayed a bit in notifying the police, so that you could get here first. A moment later we entered the rooms, a fairly expensive suite, consisting of a sitting room, bedroom, and bath. Everything was in a condition to indicate that Shirley had just come in when the shot, if shot it had been, was fired. There on the floor lay his body, still in the same attitude in which he had died, and almost as Grady had found him gasping. Grady's description of the horrible look on his face was, if anything, an understatement. As I stood with my eyes riveted on the horror-stricken face on the floor, Kennedy had been quietly going over the furniture and carpet about the body. Look, he exclaimed at last, scarcely turning to us. On the chair, the writing table, and even on the walls were little pitted marks and scratches. He bent down over the carpet. There, reflecting the electric light scattered all about, were little fine pieces of something that glittered. You have a vacuum cleaner, I suppose, inquired Craig, rising quickly. Certainly, a plant in the cellar. No, I mean one that is portable. Yes, we have that too, answered Grady, hurrying to the room telephone to have the cleaner sent up. Kennedy now began to look through Shirley's baggage. There was, however, nothing to indicate that it had been rifled. I noted, among other things, a photograph of a woman in oriental dress, dusky, languorous, of more than ordinary beauty and intelligence. On it something was written in native characters. Just then a boy wheeled the cleaner down the hall, and Kennedy quickly shoved the photograph into his pocket. First, Kennedy removed the dust that was already in the machine. Then he ran the cleaner carefully over the carpet, the upholstery, everything about that corner of the room where the body lay. When he had finished, he emptied out the dust into a paper and placed it in his pocket. He was just finishing when there came a knock at the door, and it was opened. "'Mr. Grady?' said a young man, entering hurriedly. "'Oh, hello, Glenn,' one of the night clerks in the office, Kennedy, introduced the house detective. "'I've just heard of the murder,' Glenn began. "'I was in the dining room, being relieved from my little midnight luncheon as usual, when I heard of it and I thought that perhaps you might want to know something that happened just before I went off duty. Yes, anything broke in Kennedy. It was early in the evening, returned the clerk slowly, when a messenger left a little package for Captain Shirley, said that Captain Shirley had had it sent himself, 
and asked that it be placed in his room. It was a little affair in a plain paper-wrapped parcel. I sent one of the boys up with it and a key, and told him to put the package on the writing desk tip here. Kennedy looked at me. That then was the way something, whatever it might be, was introduced into the room. When the captain came in, resumed the night clerk, I saw there was a letter for him in the mailbox and handed it to him. He stood before the office desk while he opened it. I thought he looked queer. The content seemed to alarm him. What was in it? asked Kennedy. Could you see? I got one glimpse. It seemed to be nothing but a little scarlet bead with a black spot on it. In his surprise, he dropped a piece of paper from the envelope in which the bead had been wrapped up. I thought it was strange, and as he hurried over to the elevator, I picked it up. Here it is. The clerk handed over a crumpled piece of notepaper. On it was scrawled the word, Gatter, and underneath, Beware. I spelled out the first strange word. It had an ominous sound, Gatter. Suddenly there flashed through my mind the letter Shirley had tried to print, but had not finished. G-A-D. Kennedy looked at the paper a moment. Gatter, he exclaimed in a low, tense tone. Revolt, the native word for unrest in India, the revolution. We stared at each other blankly. All of us had been reading lately in the dispatches about the troubles there, hidden under the ban of the censorship. I knew that the Hindu propaganda in America was as yet in its infancy, although several plots and conspiracies had been hatched here. Is there anyone in the hotel whom you might suspect? asked Kennedy. Grady cleared his throat and looked at the night clerk significantly. Well, he answered thoughtfully, across the hall there was a new guest who came today, or rather yesterday, a Mrs. Anthony. We don't know anything about her, except that she looks like a foreigner. She did not come directly from abroad, but must have been living in New York for some time. They tell me she asked for a room on this floor, at this end of the hall. Hmm, considered Kennedy. I'd like to see her, without being seen. I think I can arrange that, acquiesced Grady. You and Jameson stay in the bedroom. I'll ask her to come over here, and then you can get a good look at her. The plan satisfied Kennedy, and together we entered the bedroom, putting out the light and leaving the door just a trifle ajar. A moment later, Mrs. Anthony entered. I heard a suppressed gasp from Kennedy. The woman in the photograph, he whispered to me. I studied her face minutely from our coin of vantage. There was indeed a resemblance too striking to be mere coincidence. In the presence of Grady she seemed to be nervous and on guard, as though she knew intuitively that she was suspected. Did you know Captain Shirley? shot out Grady. Kennedy looked over at me and frowned. I knew that something more subtle than the New York police methods would be necessary in order to get anything from a woman like this. No, she replied quietly. You see, I just came here today. Her voice had an English accent. Did you hear a shot? No, she replied. The voices in the hall wakened me, though I did not know what was the matter until just now. Then you made no effort to find out? inquired Grady suspiciously. I am alone here in the city, she answered simply. I was afraid to intrude. Throughout she gave the impression that she was strangely reticent about herself. Evidently Kennedy had not much faith that Grady would elicit anything of importance. He tiptoed to the door that led from the bedroom to the hall and found that it could be opened from the inside. While Grady continued his questioning, Craig and I slipped out into the hall to the room which Mrs. Anthony occupied. It was a suite much plainer than that occupied by Shirley. Craig switched on the light and looked about hastily and keenly. For a moment he stood before a dressing table in which were several toilet articles. A jewel case seemed to attract his attention, and he opened it. Inside were some comparatively trifling trinkets. The thing that caused him to exclaim, however, was a necklace, broken and unstrung. I looked, too. It was composed of little crimson beads, each with a black spot on it. Quickly he drew from his pocket the photograph he had taken from Shirley's baggage. As I looked at it again, there could be no doubt now in my mind of the identity of the original. It was the same face. And about the neck in the picture was a necklace, plainly the same as that before us. What are the beads? I asked, fingering them. I've never seen anything like them. Not beads at all, he replied. 
They are Hindu prayer beans, sometimes called ruddy, jaquirity beans, seeds of the plant known to science as Abrus precatorius. They produce a deadly poison, Abrin. He slipped four or five of them into his pocket. Then he resumed his cursory search of the room. There on a writing pad was a note which Mrs. Anthony had evidently been engaged in writing. Craig pored over it for some time while I fidgeted. It was nothing but a queer jumble of letters. S-O-W-C space F-S-S-J-W-A space E-K-N-L-F-F-B-Y space W-O-V-H-L-X space I-H-W-A-J-Y-K-H space 101 M-L-E-L space E-P-J-N-V-P-S-L space W-C-L-U-R-L space G-H-I-H-D-A space E-L-B-A period Come, I caution, she may return any moment. Quickly he copied off the letters. It's a cipher, he said simply. A new and rather difficult one, too, I imagine. But I may be able to decipher it. Kennedy withdrew from the room, and instead of going back to Shirley's, rode down in the elevator to find the night clerk. Had Captain Shirley any friends in the city? asked Craig. Glenn shrugged his shoulders. He was out most of the time, he replied. He seemed to be very occupied about something. No, I don't think I ever saw him speak to a soul here, except a word to the waiters and the boys. Once, though, he recollected, he was called up by a Mrs. Beekman Rogers. Mrs. Beekman Rogers, repeated Kennedy, jotting the name down and looking it up in the telephone book. She lived on Riverside Drive, and slender though the information was, Kennedy seemed glad to get it. Grady joined us a moment later, having been wondering where we had disappeared. You saw her? he asked. What did you think of her? Worth watching, was all Kennedy would say. Did you get anything out of her? Grady shook his head. But I am convinced she knows something, he insisted. Kennedy was about to reply when he was interrupted by the arrival of a couple of detectives from the city police, tardily summoned by Grady. I shall let you know the moment I have discovered anything, he said, as he bade Grady goodbye. And thank you for letting me have a chance at the case before all the clues have been spoiled. Late though it was, in the laboratory, Kennedy set to work examining the dust which he had swept up by the vacuum cleaner, as well as the jacurity beans he had taken from Mrs. Anthony's jewel case. I do not know how much sleep he had, but I managed to snatch a few hours' rest, and early in the morning I found him at work again, examining the cipher message which he had copied. By the way, he said, scarcely looking up as he saw me again, there is something quite important which you can do for me. Rather pleased to be of some use, I waited eagerly. I wish you'd go out and see what you can find out about Mrs. Beekman Rogers, he continued. I've some work here that will keep me for several hours, so come back to me here. It was such a commission as he had often given me before, and through my connection with the star I found no difficulty in executing it. I found that Mrs. Rogers was well known in a certain circle of society in the city. She was wealthy and had the reputation of having given quite liberally to many causes that had interested her. Just now her particular fad was Oriental religions, and some of her bizarre reliefs had attracted a great deal of attention. A couple of years before she had made a trip around the world, and had lived in India for several months, apparently fascinated by the life and attracted to the mysteries of Oriental faiths. With my budget of information I hastened back again to join Kennedy at the laboratory. I could see that the cipher was still in red. From that I conjectured that it was, as he had guessed, constructed on some new and difficult plan. What do you think of Mrs. Rogers, I asked, as I finished reciting what I had learned. Is it possible that she can be in this revolutionary propaganda? He shook his head doubtfully. Much of the disaffection that exists in India today, he replied, is due to the encouragement and financial assistance which it has received from people here in this country, although only a fraction of the natives of India have ever heard of us. Much of the money devoted to the cause of revolution and anarchy in India is contributed by worthy people who innocently believe that their subscriptions are destined to promote the cause of native enlightenment. I prefer to believe that there is some such explanation in her case. 
At any rate, I think we had better make a call on Mrs. Rogers. Early that afternoon, accordingly, we found ourselves at the door of the large stone house on Riverside Drive, in which Mrs. Rogers lived. Kennedy inquired for her, and we were admitted to a large reception room, the very decorations of which showed evidence of her leaning toward the Orient. Mrs. Rogers proved to be a widow of baffling age, good-looking, with a certain indefinable attractiveness. Kennedy's cue was obvious. It was to be an eager neophyte in the mysteries of the East, and he played the part perfectly without overdoing it. Perhaps you would like to come to some of the meetings of our cult of the occult, she suggested. Delighted, I am sure, returned Kennedy. She handed him a card. We have a meeting this afternoon at four, she explained. I should be glad to welcome you among us. Kennedy thanked her and rose to go, preferring to say nothing more just then about the problems which vexed us in the Shirley case, lest it should make further investigation more difficult. Nothing more happened at the hotel, as we heard from Grady a few minutes later, and as there was some time before the cult met, we returned to the laboratory. Things had evidently progressed well, even in the few hours that he had been studying his meager evidence. Not only was he making a series of delicate chemical tests, but in cases he had several guinea pigs which he was using also. He now studied through a microscope some of the particles of dust from the vacuum cleaner. Little bits of glass, he said briefly, taking his eye from the eyepiece. Captain Shirley was not shot. Not shot, I repeated. Then how was he killed? Kennedy eyed me gravely. Shirley was murdered by a poisoned bomb. I said nothing, for the revelation was even more startling than I had imagined. In that package which was placed in his room, he went on, must have been a little infernal machine of glass, constructed so as to explode the moment the wrapper was broken. The flying pieces of glass injected the poison as by a myriad of hypodermic needles. The highly poisonous toxin of abrin, product of the jacirity, which is ordinarily destroyed in the stomach but acts powerfully if injected into the blood. Shirley died of jacirity poisoning, or rather of the alkaloid in the bean. It has been used in India for criminal poisoning for ages. Only there it is crushed, worked into a paste, and rolled into needle-pointed forms which prick the skin. Abrin is composed of two albuminous bodies, one of which resembles snake venom in all its effects, attacking the heart, making the temperature fall rapidly, and leaving the blood fluid after death. It is vegetable toxin, quite comparable with ricin from the castor oil bean. In spite of my horror at the diabolical plot that had been aimed at Shirley, my mind ran along, keenly endeavoring to piece together the scattered fragments of the case. Someone, of course, had sent the package while he was out and had placed it in his room. Had it been the same person who had sent the single jacurity bean? My mind instantly reverted to the strange woman across the hall, the photograph in his luggage, and the broken necklace in the jewel case. Kennedy continued looking at the remainder of the jacurity beans and a liquid he had developed from some of them. Finally, with a glance at his watch, he placed a tube of the liquid in a leather case in his pocket. This may not be the only murder, he remarked sententiously. It is best to be prepared. Come, we must get up to that meeting. We journeyed uptown and arrived at the little private hall which the cult of the occult had hired somewhat ahead of the time set for the meeting, as Kennedy had aimed to do. Mrs. Rogers was already there and met us at the door. So glad to see you, she welcomed, leading us in. As we entered, we could breathe the characteristic pervading odor of sandalwood. Rich oriental hangings were on the walls interspersed with cabalistic signs, while at one end was a raised dais. Mrs. Rogers introduced us to a rather stout, middle-aged, sallow-faced individual in a turban and flowing robes of rustling purple silk. His eyes were piercing, small and black. The plump, unhealthy, milk-white fingers of his hands were heavy with ornate rings. He looked like what I should have imagined a Swami to be, and such I found was indeed his title. The Swami Rajmanandra, introduced Mrs. Rogers. He extended his flabby hand in welcome, while Kennedy eyed him keenly. We were not permitted many words with the Swami, however, for Mrs. Rogers next presented us to a younger but no less interesting-looking Oriental who was in Occidental dress. This is Mr. Singh Bandamatarain, said Mrs. Rogers. 
You know, he has been sent here by the Nizam of his province to be educated at the university. Mrs. Rogers then hastened to conduct us to seats as, one by one, the worshippers entered. They were mostly women of the aristocratic type who evidently found in this cult a new fad to occupy their jaded craving for the sensational. In the dim light, there was something almost sepulchral about the gathering, and their complexion seemed as white as wax. Again the door opened and another woman entered. I felt the pressure of Kennedy's hand on my arm and turned my eyes unobtrusively. It was Mrs. Anthony. Quietly she seemed to glide over the floor toward the Swami and for a moment stood talking to him. I saw Singh eye her with a curious look. Was it fear or suspicion? I had come expecting to see something weird and wild, perhaps the exhibition of an Indian fakir. I know not what. In that at least I was disappointed. The Swami Rajmanandra, picturesque though he was, talked most fascinatingly about his religion. But either the theatricals were reserved for an inner circle, or else we were subtly suspected. For I soon found myself longing for the meeting to close, so that we could observe those whom we had come to watch. I had almost come to the conclusion that our mission had been a failure, when the Swami concluded and the visitors swarmed forward to talk with the holy man from the east. Kennedy managed to make his way about the circle to Mrs. Rogers and soon was in an animated conversation. Were you acquainted with the Captain Shirley, he asked finally, as she opened the way for the question by a remark about her life in Calcutta. Yes, she replied hesitating. I read in the papers this morning that he was found dead, most mysteriously. Terrible, wasn't it? Yes, I met him in Calcutta while I was there. Why, he was on his way to London and came to New York and called on me. My eye followed the direction of Mrs. Rogers. She was talking to us, but really her attention was centered on Mrs. Anthony and the Swami together. As I glanced back at her, I caught sight of Singh, evidently engaged in watching the same two that I was. Did he have some suspicion of Mrs. Anthony? Why was he watching Mrs. Rogers? I determined to study the two women more closely. I saw that Kennedy had already noticed what I had seen. One very peculiar thing, he said, deliberately modulating his voice so that it could be heard by those about us, was that just before he was killed, someone sent a prayer bean from a necklace to him. At the mention of the necklace, I saw that Mrs. Rogers was all attention. Involuntarily, she shot a glance at Mrs. Anthony, as if she noted that she was not wearing the necklace now. Is that Englishwoman a member of the cult? queried Kennedy a moment later, as quite naturally he looked over at Mrs. Anthony. Who is she? Oh, replied Mrs. Rogers quickly, she isn't an Englishwoman at all. She is a Hindu, I believe, a former Notch girl, daughter of a Notch girl. She passes by the name of Mrs. Anthony, but really her name is Kalia Das. Everyone in Calcutta knew her. Kennedy quietly drew his card case from his pocket and handed a card to Mrs. Rogers. I should like to talk to you about her sometime, he said in a careful whisper. If anything happens, don't hesitate to call on me. Before Mrs. Rogers could recover from her surprise, Kennedy had said goodbye and we were on our way to the laboratory. That's a curious situation, I observed. Can you make it out? How does Shirley fit into this thing? Craig hesitated a moment, as though debating whether to say anything, even to me, about his suspicions. Suppose, he said slowly, that Shirley was a secret agent of the British government, charged with the mission of finding out whether Mrs. Rogers was contributing, unknowingly perhaps, to hatching another Indian mutiny? Would that suggest anything to you? and the Notch girl whom he had known in Calcutta followed him, hoping to worm from him the secrets which he... Not too fast, he cautioned. Let us merely suppose that Shirley was a spy. If I am not mistaken, we shall see something happen soon, as a result of what I said to Mrs. Rogers. Excited now by the possibilities opened up by his conjecture regarding Shirley, which I knew must have accounted to a certainty in his mind, I watched him impatiently as he calmly set to work cleaning up the remainder of the laboratory investigation in the affair. It was scarcely half an hour later that a car drove up furiously to our door and Mrs. Rogers burst in, terribly agitated. "'You remember,' she cried breathlessly, "'you said that a Jekariti bean was sent to Captain Shirley?' "'Yes,' encouraged Kennedy. "'Well, after you left I was thinking about it. That Kalia Das used to wear a necklace of them but she didn't have it on today. 
I began thinking about it. While she was talking to the Swami, I went over. I've noticed how careful she always is of her handbag. So I managed to catch my hand in the loop about her wrist. It dropped on the floor. We both made a dive for it, but I got it. I managed also to open the catch, and when I picked it up to hand it to her, with an apology, what should roll out but a score of prayer beans? Some papers dropped out, too. She almost tore them from my hands. In fact, one of them did tear. After it was over, I had this scrap, a corner torn off one of them. Kennedy took the scrap which she handed to him and studied it carefully while we looked over his shoulder. On it was a queer alphabetical table. Across the first line were letters singly, each followed by a dash. Then in squares underneath were pairs of letters. A, A, B, A, C, A, D, A, and so on, while vertically the column on the left read A, 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 B, A, C, A, D, and so on. Thank you, Mrs. Rogers, Craig said, rising. This is very important. She seemed reluctant to go, but as there was no excuse for staying longer, she finally left. Kennedy immediately set to work studying the scrap of paper and the cipher message he had copied, while I stifled my impatience as best I could. I could do nothing but reflect on the possibility of what a jealous woman might do. Mrs. Rogers had given us one example. Did the same explanation shed any light on the mystery of the Notch Girl and the Jacariti being sent to Shirley? There was no doubt now that Shirley had known her in Calcutta, intimately, also. Perhaps the necklace had some significance. At least he must have remembered it, as his agitation over the single bean and the word gather seemed to indicate. If she had sent it to him, was it as a threat? To all appearance he had not known that she was in New York much less that she was at the same hotel and on the same floor. Why had she followed him? Had she misinterpreted his attentions to Mrs. Rogers? Longing to ask Kennedy the myriad questions that flashed through my mind, I turned to him as he scowled at the scrap of paper and the cipher before him. Presently he glanced up at me, still scowling. It's no use, Walter, he said. I can't make it out without the key. At least it will take so long to discover the key that it may be useless. Just then the telephone bell rang and he sprang to it eagerly. As I listened, I gathered that it was another hurry call from Grady. Something has happened to Mrs. Anthony, cried Craig, as he hooked up the receiver and seized his hat. A second time we posted to the Prince Edward Charles, spurred by the mystery that surrounded the case. No one met us in the lobby this time, and we rode up directly in the elevator to Mrs. Anthony's room. As we came down the hall and Grady met us at the door, he did not need to tell us that something was wrong. One experience like that with Shirley had put the hotel people on guard, and the house physician was already there, administering stimulants to Mrs. Anthony, who was lying on the bed. "'It's just like the other case,' whispered Grady. "'There are the same scratches on her face and hands.' The doctor glanced about at us. By the look on his face I read that it was a losing fight. Kennedy bent down. The floor about the door was covered with little glittering slivers of glass. On Mrs. Anthony's face was the same drawn look as on Shirley's. Was it suicide? Had we been getting too close on her trail, or had Mrs. Anthony been attacked? Had someone been using her, and now was afraid of her and sought to get her out of the way for safety? What was the secret locked in her silent lips? The woman was plainly dying. Would she carry the secret with her, after all? Kennedy quickly drew from his pocket the vial which I had seen him place there in the laboratory early in the day. From the doctor's case he selected a hypodermic and coolly injected a generous dose of the stuff into her arm. "'What is it?' asked the doctor, as we all watched her face anxiously. "'The antitoxin to the abrin,' he replied. "'I developed some of it at the same time I was studying the poison. If an animal that is immune to a toxin is bled and the serum collected, the antitoxin in it may be injected into a healthy animal and render it immune. Ricin and abrin are vegetable protein toxins of enormous potency and exert a narcotic action. Guinea pigs fed on them in proper doses attain such a degree of immunity that, in a short time, they can tolerate four hundred times the fatal dose. The serum also can be used to neutralize the toxin in another animal, to a certain extent. We crowded about Kennedy and the doctor. Our eyes riveted on the drawn face before us. Would the antitoxin work? 
Meanwhile, Kennedy moved over to the writing table which he had examined on our first visit to the room. Covered up in the writing pad was still the paper which he had copied. Only Mrs. Anthony had added much more to it. He looked at it desperately. What good would it do if, after hours, his cleverness might solve the cipher too late? Mrs. Anthony seemed to be struggling bravely. Once I thought she was almost conscious. Glazed though her eyes looked, she saw Kennedy vaguely with the paper in his hand. Her lips moved. Kennedy bent down, though whether he heard or read her lip movements I do not know. "'Her pocketbook!' he exclaimed. We found it crushed under her coat which she had taken off when she entered. Craig opened it and drew forth a crumpled sheet of paper from which a corner had been torn. It exactly fitted the scrap that Mrs. Rogers had given us. There, contained within twenty-seven horizontal and twenty-seven vertical lines, making in all six hundred and seventy-six squares, was every possible combination of two letters of the alphabet. Kennedy looked up, still in desperation. It did him no good. He could have completed the table himself. In the lining. Her lips managed to frame the words. Kennedy literally tore the bag apart. There was nothing but a plain white blank card. With a superhuman effort she moved her lips again. Smelling salts, she seemed to say. I looked about. On the dressing table stood a little dark green bottle. I pulled the ground glass stopper from it and a most pungent odor of carbonate of ammonia filled the room. Quickly I held it under her nose, but she shook her head weakly. Kennedy seemed to understand. He snatched the bottle from me and held the card directly over its mouth. As the fumes of the ammonia poured out, I saw faintly on the card the letters H.R. We turned to Mrs. Anthony. The effort had used up her strength. She had lapsed again into unconsciousness as Craig bent over her. Will she live? I asked. I think so, he replied, adding a hasty word to the doctor. What's that? Look, I exclaimed, pointing to the card from which the letters H.R. had already faded, as mysteriously as they had appeared, leaving the card blank again. It is the key, he cried excitedly, written in sympathetic ink. At last we have it all. On the queer alphabetical table which the two pieces of paper made, he now wrote quickly the alphabet again, horizontally across the top, starting with H, and vertically down the side, starting with R, thus. Please note, at this time the reader chooses to describe rather than narrate a very large alphabetic table embedded in this chapter. The table consists of spaced upper and lower case letters, and its purpose will become evident in the context of the story. We continue as follows. See? exclaimed Kennedy triumphantly, working rapidly. Take the word war, for instance. The square which contains W-A is in line S, column D. So I put down S-D. The odd letter R, with a dash, is in line R, column Y. So I put down R-Y. War thus becomes S-D-R-Y. Working it backward from S-D-R-Y, I take the two letters S-D. In line S, column D, I find W-A in the square, and in line R, column Y, I find just R, making the translation of the cipher read WAR. Now, he went on excitedly, take the message we have. S-O-W-C, F-S-S-J-W-A, E-K-N-L-F-F-B-Y, W-O-V-H-L-X, I-H-W-A-J-Y-K-H, 101-M-L-E-L, E-P-J-N-V-P-S-L, W-C-L-U-R-L, G-H-I-H-D-A-E-L-B-A. I translate each pair of letters as I come to them. He was writing rapidly. There was the message. Have located New York headquarters at 101 Eveningside Avenue, apartment K. Kennedy did not pause, but dashed from the room, followed by Grady and myself. As our taxi pulled up on the avenue, we saw that the address was a new but small apartment house. We entered and located apartment K. Casting about for a way to get in, Craig discovered that the fire escape could be reached from a balcony by the hall window. He swung himself over the gap and we followed. It was the work of only a minute to force the window latch. We entered. No one was there. As we pressed after him, he stopped short and flashed his electric bullseye about with an exclamation of startled surprise. There was a fully equipped chemical and electrical laboratory. 
There were explosives enough to have blown not only us, but a whole block to kingdom come. More than that, it was a veritable den of poisons. On a table stood beakers and test tubes in which was crushed a paste that still showed parts of the red rutty beans. Someone planned here to kill Shirley, get him out of the way, reconstructed Kennedy gazing about, someone working under the cloak of Oriental religion. Mrs. Anthony? queried Grady. Kennedy shook his head. On the contrary, like Shirley, she was an agent of the Indian Secret Service. The rest of the cipher shows it. She was sent to watch someone else, as he was sent to watch Mrs. Rogers. Neither could have known that the other was on the case. She found out, first, that the package with the prayer bean and the word gadder was an attempt to warn and save Shirley, whom she had known in Calcutta and still loved, but feared to compromise. She must have tried to see him, but failed. She hesitated to write, but finally did. Then someone must have seen that she was dangerous. Another poison bomb was sent to her. No, the notch girl is innocent. Shh! cautioned Grady. Outside we could hear the footsteps of someone coming along the hall. Kennedy snapped off his light. The door opened. Stand still. One motion and I will throw it. As Kennedy's voice rang out from the direction of the table on which stood the half-finished glass bombs, Grady and I flung ourselves forward at the intruder, not knowing what we would encounter. A moment later Kennedy had found the electric switch and flashed up the lights. It was Singh, who had used both Mrs. Rogers' money and Raymond Andra's religion to cover his conspiracy of revolt. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of the Treasure Train by Arthur B. Reeve. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Phantom Destroyer. Guy Fox himself would shudder in that mill. Think of it. Five explosions on five successive days, and not a clue. Our visitor had presented a card bearing the name of Donald McLeod, chief of the Nitropolis Powder Company Secret Service. It was plain that he was greatly worried over the case about which he had at last been forced to consult Kennedy. As he spoke, I remembered having read in the dispatches about the explosions, but the accounts had been so meager that I had not realized that there was anything especially unusual about them, for it was at the time when accidents in and attacks on the munitions plants were of common occurrence. Why, went on McLeod, the whole business is as mysterious as if there were some phantom destroyer at work. The men are so frightened that they threaten to quit. Several have been killed. There's something strange about that, too. There are ugly rumors of poisonous gases being responsible, quite as much as the explosions, though so far I've been able to find nothing in that notion. What sort of place is it? asked Kennedy, interested at once. Well, you see, explained McLeod, since the company's business has increased so fast lately, it has been forced to erect a new plant. Perhaps you have heard of the old Grove Amusement Park, which failed? It's not far from that. McLeod looked at us inquiringly. Kennedy nodded to go on, though I am sure neither of us was familiar with the place. They've called the new plant Nitropolis. Rather a neat name for a powder works, don't you think? resumed McLeod. Everything went along all right until a few days ago. Then one of the buildings, a storehouse, was blown up. We couldn't be sure that it was an accident, so we redoubled our precautions. It was of no use. That started it. The very next day another building was blown up, then another, until now there have been five of them. What may happen today, heaven only knows. I want to get back as soon as I can. Rather too frequent, I must admit, to be coincidences, remarked Kennedy. No, they can't all be accidents, asserted McLeod confidently. There's too great regularity for that. I think I've considered almost everything. I don't see how they can be from bombs placed by workmen. At least it's not a bit likely. Besides, the explosions all occur in broad daylight, not at night. We're very careful about the men we employ, and they're watched all the time. The company has a guard of its own, twenty-five picked men, under me, all honorably discharged United States Army men. You have formed no theory of your own? queried Kennedy. McLeod paused then drew from his pocket the clipping of a dispatch from the front, in which one of the war correspondents reported the destruction of wire entanglements with heat, supposed to have been applied by the use of reflecting mirrors. I'm reduced to pure speculation, he remarked. 
Today they seem to be reviving all the ancient practices. Maybe someone is going at it like Archimedes. Not impossible, returned Craig, handing back the clipping. Buffon tested the probability of the achievement of Archimedes in setting fire to the ships of Marcellus with mirrors and the sun's rays. He constructed a composite mirror of a hundred and twenty-eight plain mirrors, and with it he was able to ignite wood at two hundred and ten feet. However, I shrewdly suspect that, even if this story is true, they are using hydrogen or acetylene flares over there. But none of these things would be feasible in your case. You'd know it. Could it be someone who is projecting a deadly wireless force which causes the explosions I put in, mindful of a previous case of Kennedy's? We all know that inventors have been working for years on the idea of making explosives obsolete and guns junk. If someone is hit on a way of guiding an electric wave through the air and concentrating power at a point, munitions plants could be wiped out. McLeod looked anxiously from me to Kennedy, but Craig betrayed nothing by his face except his interest. Sometimes I have imagined I heard a peculiar faint whirring noise in the air, he remarked thoughtfully. I thought of having the men on the watch for airships, but they've never seen a trace of one. It might be some power either like this, he added, shaking the clipping, or like that which Mr. Jameson suggests. It's something like that you meant, I presume, when you called it a phantom destroyer a moment ago? asked Kennedy. McLeod nodded. If you're interested, he pursued hastily, and feel like going down there to look things over, I think the best place for you to go would be to the Sneddons. There are some people who have seen a chance to make a little money out of the boom. Many visitors are now coming and going on business connected with the new works. They have started a boarding house, or rather Mrs. Sneddon has. There's a daughter, too, who seems to be very popular. Kennedy glanced whimsically at me. Well, Walter, he remarked tentatively, entirely aside from the young lady, this ought to make a good story for the star. Indeed it ought, I replied enthusiastically. Then you'll go down to Nitropolis? queried McLeod eagerly. You can catch a train that will get you there about noon, and the company will pay you well. McLeod, with the mystery, Miss Sneddon, and the remuneration, you are irresistible, smiled Kennedy. Thank you, returned the detective. You won't regret it. I can't tell you how much relieved I feel to have someone else, and above all, yourself, on the case. You can get a train in half an hour. I think it would be best for you to go as though you had no connection with me, at least for the present. Kennedy agreed, and McLeod excused himself, promising to be on the train, although not to ride with us, in case we should be the target of two inquisitive eyes. For a few moments, while our taxicab was coming, Kennedy considered thoughtfully what the company detective had said. By the time the vehicle arrived, he had hurriedly packed up some apparatus in two large grips, one of which had fell to my lot to carry. The trip down to Nitropolis was uninteresting, and we arrived at the little station shortly after noon. McLeod was on the train, but did not speak to us, and it was perhaps just as well, for the cabmen and others hanging about the station were keenly watching new arrivals, and anyone with McLeod must have attracted attention. We selected, or were rather selected by one of the cabmen, and driven immediately to the Sneddon house. Our cover was, as Craig and I had decided, to pose as two newspaper men from New York, that being the easiest way to account for any undue interest we might show in things. The powder company's plant was situated on a large tract of land which was surrounded by a barbed wire fence, six feet high and constructed in a manner very similar to the fences used in protecting prison camps in war times. At various places along the several miles of fence gates were placed with armed guards. Many other features were suggestive of war times. One that impressed us most was that each workman had to carry a pass similar almost to a passport. This entire fence, we learned, was patrolled day and night by armed guards. A mile or so from the plant, or just outside the main gate, quite a settlement had grown up, like a mushroom, almost overnight, the product of a flood of new money. Originally there had been only one house for some distance about, that of the Sneddons. But now there were scores of houses, mostly those of officials and managers, some of them really pretentious affairs. McLeod himself lived in one of them, and we could see him ahead of us being driven home. The workmen lived farther along the line, in a sort of company town, which at present greatly resembled a western mining camp, though ultimately it was to be a bungalow town. 
Just at present, however, it was the Snedden house that interested us most, for we felt the need of getting ourselves established in this strange community. It was an old-fashioned farmhouse and had been purchased very cheaply by Snedden several years before. He had altered it and brought it up to date, and the combination of old and new proved to be typical of the owner as well as of the house. Kennedy carried off well the critical situation of our introduction, and we found ourselves welcomed rather than scrutinized as intruders. Garfield Snedden was much older than his second wife, Ida. In fact, she did not seem to be much older than Snedden's daughter, Gertrude, whom MacLeod had already mentioned, a dashing young lady, never intended by nature to vegetate in the rural seclusion that her father had sought before the advent of the powder works. Mrs. Snedden was one of those capable women who can manage a man without his knowing it. Indeed, one felt that Snedden, who was somewhat of both student and dreamer, needed a manager. I'm glad your train was on time, bustled Mrs. Snedden. Luncheon will be ready in a few moments now. We had barely time to look about before Gertrude led us into the dining room and introduced us to the other boarders. Knowing human nature, Kennedy was careful to be struck with admiration and amazement at everything we had seen in our brief whirl through Nitropolis. It was not a difficult or entirely assumed feeling either when one realized that only a few short months before the region had been nothing better than an almost hopeless wilderness of scrub pines. We did not have to wait long before the subject uppermost in our minds was brought up, the explosions. Among the boarders there were at least two who from the start promised to be interesting as well as important. One was a tall, slender chap named Gerritsen, whose connection with the company I gathered from the conversation took him often on important matters to New York. The other was an older man, Jackson, who seemed to be connected with the management of the works, a reticent fellow, more given to listening to others than to talking himself. "'Nothing has happened so far today, anyhow,' remarked Gerritsen, tapping the back of his chair with his knuckle as a token of respect for that evil spirit who seems to be exercised by knocking wood. "'Oh!' exclaimed Gertrude, with a little half-suppressed shudder. "'I do hope those terrible explosions are at last over.' "'If I had my way,' asserted Gerritsen savagely, "'I'd put this town under martial law until they were over.' It may come to that, put in Jackson quietly. Quite in keeping with the present tendency of the age, agreed Snedden, in a tone of philosophical disagreement. I don't think it makes much difference how you accomplish the result, Garfield, chimed in his wife, as long as you accomplish it, and it is one that should be accomplished. Snedden retreated into the refuge of silence. Though this was only a bit of the conversation, we soon found out that he was an avowed pacifist. Gerritsen, on the other hand, was an ardent militarist, a good deal of a fire-eater. I wondered whether there might not be a good deal of poseur about him, too. It needed no second sight to discover that both he and Gertrude were deeply interested in each other. Gerritsen was what Broadway would call a live one, and though there was nothing essentially wrong with that, I fancied that I detected, now and then, an almost maternal solicitude on the part of her stepmother who seemed to be watching both the young man and her husband alternately. Once Jackson and Mrs. Snedden exchanged glances, there seemed to be some understanding between them. The time to return to the works was approaching, and we all rose. Somehow Gertrude and Gerritsen seemed naturally to gravitate toward the door together. Some distance from the house there was a large barn. Part of it had been turned into a garage where Gerritsen kept a fast car. Jackson also had a roadster. In fact, in this new community, with its superabundant new wealth, everybody had a car. Kennedy and I sauntered out after the rest. As we turned an angle of the house, we came suddenly upon Garrison and his racer talking to Gertrude. The crunch of the gravel under our feet warned them before we saw them, but not before we could catch a glimpse of a warning finger on the rosy lips of Gertrude. As she saw us, she blushed ever so slightly. "'You'll be late,' she cried hastily. Mr. Jackson has been gone five minutes. On foot, returned Gerritsen nonchalantly. I'll overtake him in thirty seconds. Nevertheless, he did not wait longer, but swung up the road at a pace which was the admiration of all speed-loving nitropolitans. Craig had ordered our taxicab driver to stop for us after lunch, and without exciting suspicion, managed to stow away the larger part of the contents of our grips in his car. Still without openly showing our connection with MacLeod, Kennedy sought out the manager of the works, 
and though scores of correspondents and reporters from various newspapers had vainly applied for permission to inspect the plant, somehow we seemed to receive the freedom of the place and without exciting suspicion. Craig's first move was to look the plant over. As we approached it, our attention was instantly attracted to the numerous one-story galvanized iron buildings that appeared to stretch endlessly in every direction. They seemed to be of a temporary nature, though the power plants, offices, and other necessary buildings were very substantially built. The framework of the factory buildings was nothing but wood covered by iron sheathing, and even the sides seemed to be removable. The floors, however, were of concrete. They served their purpose well, observed Kennedy, as we picked our way about. Explosions at powder mills are frequent anyhow. After an explosion there is very little debris to clear away, as you may imagine. These buildings are easily repaired or replaced, and they keep a large force of men for these purposes, as well as materials for any emergency. One felt instinctively the hazard of the employment. Everywhere were signs telling what not and what to do. One that stuck in my mind was, it is better to be careful than sorry. Throughout the plant at frequent intervals were first aid stations with kits for all sorts of accidents, including respirators, for workmen were often overcome by ether or alcohol fumes. Everything was done to minimize the hazard, yet one could not escape the conviction that human life and limb were as much a cost of production in this industry as fuel and raw material. Once, in our wanderings about the plant, I recall we ran across both Garretson and Jackson in one of the offices. They did not see us, but seemed to be talking very earnestly about something. What it was we could not guess, but this time it seemed to be Jackson who was doing most of the talking. Kennedy watched them as they parted. There's something peculiar under the surface with those people at the boarding house, was all he observed. Come, over there, about an eighth of a mile. I think I see evidences of the latest of the explosions. Let's look at it. McLeod had evidently reasoned that sooner or later, Kennedy would appear in this part of the grounds, and as we passed one of the shops he joined us. You mentioned something about rumors of poisonous gases, hinted Craig, as we walked along. Yes, assented McLeod. I don't know what there is in it. I suppose you know that there is a very poisonous gas, carbon monoxide, or carbonic oxide, formed in considerable quantity by the explosion of several of the powders commonly used in shells. The gas has a curious power of combining with the blood and refusing to let go, thus keeping out the oxygen necessary for life. It may be that that is what accounts for what we've seen, that it is actual poisoning to death of men not killed by the immediate explosion. We had reached the scene of the previous day's disaster. No effort had yet been made to clear it up. Kennedy went over it carefully. What it was he found I do not know, but he had not spent much time before he turned to me. Walter, he directed, I wish you would go back to the office near the gate where I left that paraphernalia we brought down. Carry it over. Let me see. There's an open space there on that knoll. I'll join you there. Whatever was in the packages was both bulky and heavy, and I was glad to reach the hillside he had indicated. Craig was waiting for me there with McLeod, and at once opened the packages. From them he took a thin steel rod, which he set up in the center of the open space. To it he attached a frame, and to the frame what looked like four reversed megaphones. Attached to the frame, which was tubular, was an oak box with a little arrangement of hard rubber and metal, which fitted into the ears. For some time Kennedy's face wore a set, faraway expression, as if he were studying something. The explosion seemed always to occur in the middle of the afternoon, observed McLeod, fidgeting apprehensively. Kennedy motioned petulantly for silence. Then suddenly he pulled the tubes out of his ears and gazed about sharply. There's something in the air, he cried. I can hear it. McLeod and I strained our eyes. There was nothing visible. This is an anti-aircraft listening post, such as the French use, explained Craig hurriedly. Between the horns and the microphone in the box you can catch the hum of an engine even when it is muffled. If there is an airplane or a zeppelin about, this thing would locate it. Still there was nothing that we could see, though now the sound was just perceptible to the ear if one strained his attention a bit. I listened. He was plain in the detector, yet nothing was visible. What strange power could it be that we could not see or feel in broad daylight? 
Just then came a low rumbling, and then a terrific roar from the direction of the plant. We swung about in time to see a huge cloud of debris lifted literally into the air above the treetops and dropped to earth again. The silence that succeeded the explosion was eloquent. The phantom destroyer had delivered his blow again. The distillery, where we make the denatured alcohol, cried MacLeod. Gazing with tense faces from other buildings, we could see men pouring forth, panic-stricken, and the silence was punctured by shouts. Kennedy bent over his detector. That same mysterious buzzing, he muttered, only fainter. Together we hastened now toward the distillery, another of those corrugated iron buildings. It had been completely demolished. Here and there lay a dark, still mess. I shuddered. They were men. As we ran toward the ruin, we crossed the baseball field which the company had given the men. I looked back for Kennedy. He had paused at the wire backstop behind the catcher. Something caught in the wires interested him. By the time I reached him, he had secured it, a long slender metal tube, cleverly weighted so as to fall straight. Not a hundred percent of hits, evidently, he muttered. Still, one was enough. What is it? asked MacLeod. An incendiary pastille. On contact, the nose burns away anything it hits, goes right through corrugated iron. It carries a charge of thermit, ignited by this piece of magnesium ribbon. You know what thermit will penetrate with its thousands of degrees of heat. Only the nose of this went through the netting and never touched a thing. This didn't explode anything, but another one did. Thousands of gallons of alcohol did the rest. Kennedy had picked up his other package as we ran, and was now busily unwrapping it. I looked about at the crowd that had collected, and saw that there was nothing we could do to help. Once I caught sight of Gertrude's face. She was pale, and seemed eagerly searching for someone. Then in the crowd I lost her. I turned to MacLeod. He was plainly overwhelmed. Kennedy was grimly silent and at work on something he had jammed into the ground. Stand back, he cautioned, as he touched a match to the thing. With a muffled explosion, something whizzed and shrieked up into the air like a skyrocket. Far above, I could now see a thing open out like a parachute, while below it trailed something that might have been the stick of a rocket. Eagerly, Kennedy followed the parachute as the wind wafted it along and it sank slowly to the earth. When at last he recovered it, I saw that between the parachute and the stick was fastened a small, peculiar camera. A Scheinflug multiple camera, he explained as he seized it almost ravenously. Is there a place in town where I can get the films in this developed quickly? McLeod himself, excited now, hurried us from the scene of the explosion to a local drugstore, which combined most of the functions of a general store, even being able to improvise a dark room in which Kennedy could work. It was some time after the excitement over the explosion had quieted down that McLeod and I, standing impatiently before the drugstore, saw Snedden wildly tearing down the street in his car. He saw us and pulled up at the curb with a jerk. "'Where's Gertrude?' he shouted wildly. "'Has anyone seen my daughter?' Breathlessly he explained that he had been out, had returned to find his house deserted, Gertrude gone, his wife gone, even Jackson's car gone from the barn. He had been to the works. Neither Gerritsen nor Jackson had been seen since the excitement of the explosion, they told him. Gerritsen's racer was gone too. There seemed to have been a sort of family explosion also. Kennedy had heard the loud talking and had left his work to the druggist to carry on and joined us. There was no concealment now of our connection with MacLeod, for it was to him that everyone in town came when in trouble. In almost no time, so accurately did he keep his fingers on the fevered pulse of Nitropolis, MacLeod had found out that Gertrude had been seen driving away from the company's grounds with someone in Gerritsen's car, probably Gerritsen himself. Jackson had been seen hurrying down the street. Someone else had seen Ida Snedden in Jackson's car alone. Meanwhile, over the wire, McLeod had sent out descriptions of the four people in the two cars, in the hope of intercepting them before they could be plunged into the obscurity of any nearby city. Not content with that, McLeod and Kennedy started out in the former's car while I climbed in with Snedden, and we began a systematic search of the roads out of Nitropolis. As we sped along, I could not help feeling, though I said nothing, that somehow the strange disappearances must have something to do with the mysterious phantom destroyer. 
I did not tell even Snedden about the little that Kennedy had discovered, for I had learned that it was best to let Craig himself tell, at his own time and in his own way. But the man seemed frantic in his search, and I could not help the impression that there was something, perhaps only a suspicion, that he knew which might shed some light. We were coming down the river, or rather the bay, after a fruitless search of unfrequented roads and were approaching the deserted old grove amusement park, to which excursions used years ago to come in boats. No one could make it pay, and it was closed and going to ruin. There had been some hint that Garrison's racer might have disappeared down this unfrequented river road. As we came to a turn in the road, we could see Kennedy and McLeod in their car coming up. Instead of keeping on, however, they turned into the grove, Kennedy leaning far over the running board as McLeod drove slowly, following his directions, as though Craig were tracing something. With a hurried exclamation of surprise, Snedden gave our car the gas and shot ahead, swinging around after them. They were headed, following some kind of tire tracks, toward an old merry-go-round that was dismantled and all boarded up. They heard us coming and stopped. "'Has anyone told you that Garrison's car went down the river road, too?' called Snedden anxiously. "'No, but someone thought he saw Jackson's car come down here,' called back McLeod. "'Jackson's?' exclaimed Snedden. "'Maybe both are right,' I ventured as we came closer. "'What made you turn in here?' Kennedy thought he saw fresh tire tracks running into the grove. We were all out of our cars by this time and examining the soft roadway with Craig. It was evident to anyone that a car had been run in, and not so very long ago, in the direction of the merry-go-round. We followed the tracks on foot, bending about the huge circle of a building until we came to the side away from the road. The tracks seemed to run right in under the boards. Kennedy approached and touched the boards. They were loose. Someone had evidently been there, had taken them down, and put them up. In fact, by the marks on them, it seemed as though he had made a practice of doing so. McLeod and Kennedy unhooked the boarding, while Snedden looked on in a sort of daze. They had taken down only two or three sections, which indicated that the whole side might similarly be removed, when I heard a low, startled exclamation from Snedden. We peered in. There, in the half-light of the gloomy interior, we could see a car. Before we knew it, Snedden had darted past us. An instant later, I distinguished what is more sensitive I had seen, a woman, all alone in the car, motionless. "'Ida!' he cried. There was no answer. "'She... she's dead!' he shouted. It was only too true. There was Ida Snedden, seated in Jackson's car in the old deserted building, all shut up, dead. Yet her face was as pink as if she were alive and the blood had been whipped into her cheeks by a walk in the cold wind. We looked at one another, at a loss. How did she get there, and why? She must have come there voluntarily. No one had seen anyone else with her in the car. Snedden was now almost beside himself. Misfortunes never come singly, he wailed. My daughter Gertrude gone, now my wife dead. Confound that young fellow Garrison, and Jackson too. Where are they? Why have they fled? The scoundrels. They have stolen my whole family. Oh, what shall I do? What shall I do? Trying to quiet Snedden, at the same time we began to look about the building. On one side was a small stove, in which were still the dying coals of a fire. Nearby were a workbench, some tools, pieces of wire, and other material. Scattered about were pieces of material that looked like celluloid. Someone evidently used the place as a secret workshop. Kennedy picked up a piece of the celluloid-like stuff and carefully touched a match to it. It did not burn rapidly as celluloid does, and Craig seemed more than ever interested. McLeod himself was no mean detective. Accustomed to action, he had an idea of what to do. "'Wait here,' he called back, dashing out. "'I'm going to the nearest house up the road for help. I'll be back in a moment.' We heard him back and turn his car and shoot away. Meanwhile, Kennedy was looking over carefully Jackson's roadster. He tapped the gas tank in the rear, then opened it. There was not a drop of gas in it. He lifted up the hood and looked inside at the motor. Whatever he saw there, he said nothing. Finally, by siphoning some gas from Snedden's tank and making some adjustments, he seemed to have the car in a condition again for it to run. He was just about to start it when McLeod returned, carrying a canary bird in a cage. 
I've telephoned to town, he announced. Someone will be here soon now. Meanwhile, an idea occurred to me, and I borrowed this bird. Let me see whether the idea is any good. Kennedy, by this time, had started the engine. McLeod placed the bright little songster near the stove on the workbench and began to watch it narrowly. More than ever up in the air over the mystery, I could only watch Kennedy and McLeod, each following his own lines. It might perhaps have been ten minutes after McLeod returned, and during that time he had never taken his eyes off the bird, when I began to feel a little drowsy. A word from McLeod roused me. "'There's carbon monoxide in the air, Kennedy!' he exclaimed. "'You know how this gas affects birds?' Kennedy looked over intently. The canary had begun to show evident signs of distress over something. "'It must be that this stove is defective,' pursued McLeod, picking up the poor little bird and carrying it quickly into the fresh air, where it could regain its former liveliness. Then, when he returned, he added, "'There must be some defect in the stove or the draft that makes it send out the poisonous gas.' "'There's some gas,' agreed Kennedy. It must have cleared away mostly, though, or we couldn't stand it ourselves. Craig continued to look about the car and the building, in the vain hope of discovering some other clue. Had Mrs. Snedden been killed by the carbonic oxide? Was it a case of gas poisoning? Then, too, why had she been here at all? Who had shut her up? Had she been overcome first and, in a stupor, been unable to move to save herself? Above all, what had this to do with the mysterious phantom slayer that had wrecked so many of the works in less than a week? It was quite late in the afternoon when, at last, people came from the town and took away both the body of Mrs. Snedden and Jackson's car. Snedden could only stare and work his fingers, and after we had seen him safely in the care of someone we could trust, Kennedy, McLeod, and I climbed into McLeod's car silently. "'It's too deep for me,' acknowledged McLeod. "'What shall we do next?' Surely that fellow must have my pictures developed by this time, considered Kennedy. Shoot back there. They came out beautifully, all except one, reported the druggist, who was somewhat of a camera fiend himself. That's a wonderful system, sir. Kennedy thanked him for his trouble and took the prints. With care he pieced them together until he had several successive panoramas of the country taken from various elevations of the parachute. Then, with a magnifying glass, he went over each section minutely, Look at that, he pointed out at last with the sharp tip of a pencil on one picture. In what looked like an open space among some trees was a tiny figure of a man. It seemed as if he were hacking at something with an axe. What the something was did not appear in the picture. I should say that it was half a mile, perhaps a mile, farther away than that grove, commented Kennedy, making a rough calculation. On the old Davis farm, considered McLeod. Look and see if you can't make out the ruins of a house somewhere nearby. It was burned many years ago. Yes, yes, returned Kennedy excitedly. There's the place. Do you think we can get there in a car before it's dark? Easily, replied McLeod. It was only a matter of minutes before we three were poking about in a tangle of wood and field, seeking to locate the spot where Kennedy's apparatus had photographed the lone axeman. At last, in a large, cleared field, we came upon a most peculiar heap of debris. As nearly as I could make out, it was a pile of junk, but most interesting junk. Practically all of it consisted in broken bits of the celluloid-like stuff we had seen in the abandoned building. Twisted inextricably about were steel wires and bits of all sorts of material. In the midst of the wreckage was something that looked for all the world like the remains of a gas motor. It was not rusted either, which indicated that it had been put there recently. As he looked at it, Craig's face displayed a smile of satisfaction. Looks as though it might have been an airplane of the tractor type, he vouchsafed finally. Surely there couldn't have been an accident, objected McLeod. No aviator could have lived through it, and there's no body. No, it was purposely destroyed, continued Craig. It was landed here from somewhere else for that purpose. That was what the man in the picture was doing with the axe. After the last explosion, something happened. He brought the machine here to destroy the evidence. But, persisted McLeod, if there had been an airplane hovering about, we should have seen it in the air, passing over the works at the time of the explosion. Kennedy picked the pieces significantly. Someone about here has kept abreast of the times, if not ahead. 
See, the planes were of this non-inflammable celluloid that made it virtually transparent and visible only at a few hundred feet in the air. The aviator could fly low and so drop those pastilles accurately and unseen. The engine had one of those new muffler boxes. He would have been unheard, too, except for that delicate airship detector. McLeod and I could but stare at each other aghast. Without a doubt it was in the old merry-go-round building that the phantom aviator had established his hangar. What the connection was between the tragedy in the Snedden family and the tragedy in the powder works we did not know, but at least now we knew that there was some connection. It was growing dark rapidly, and with some difficulty we retraced our steps to the point where we had left the car. We whirled back to the town and, of course, to the Snedden house. Snedden was sitting in the parlor when we arrived, by the body of his wife, staring, speechless, straight before him, while several neighbors were gathered about, trying to console him. We had scarcely entered when a messenger boy came up the path from the gate. Both Kennedy and McLeod turned toward him, expecting some reply to the numerous messages of alarm sent out earlier in the afternoon. "'Telegram for Mrs. Snedden,' announced the boy. "'Mrs. Snedden?' queried Kennedy, surprised. Then quickly, "'Oh, yes, that's all right. I'll take care of it.' He signed for the message, tore it open, and read it. For a moment his face, which had been clouded, smoothed out, and he took a couple of turns up and down the hall, as though undecided. Finally he crumpled the telegram abstractedly and shoved it into his pocket. We followed him as he went into the parlor and stood for several moments, looking fixedly on the strangely flushed face of Mrs. Snedden. McLeod, he said, finally, turning gravely toward us, and for the present seeming to ignore the presence of the others. This amazing series of crimes has brought home to me forcibly the alarming possibilities of applying modern scientific devices to criminal uses. New modes and processes seem to bring new menaces. Like carbon monoxide poisoning, suggested McLeod. Of course, it has long been known as a harmful gas, but... Let us see, interrupted Kennedy. Walter, you were there when I examined Jackson's car. There was not a drop of gasoline in the tank, you will recall. Even the water in the radiator was low. I lifted the hood. Someone must have tampered with the carburetor. It was adjusted so that the amount of air in the mixture was reduced. More than that, I don't know whether you noticed it or not, but the spark and gas were set so that, when I did put gasoline in the tank, I had but to turn the engine over and it went. In other words, that car had been standing there, the engine running, until it simply stopped for want of fuel. He paused while we listened intently, then resumed. The gas engine and gas motor have brought with them another of those unanticipated menaces of which I spoke. Whenever the explosion of the combustible mixture is incomplete or of moderated intensity, a gas of which little is known may be formed in considerable quantities. In this case, as in several others that have come to my attention, vapors arising from the combustion must have emitted certain noxious products. The fumes that caused Ida Snedden's death were not of carbon monoxide from the stove, McLeod. They were splitting products of gasoline, which are so new to science that they have not yet been named. Mrs. Snedden's death, I may say for the benefit of the coroner, was due to the absorption of some of these unidentified gaseous poisons. They are as deadly as a knife thrust through the heart, under certain conditions. Due to the non-oxidization of some of the elements of gasoline, they escape from the exhaust of every running gas engine. In the open air, where only a whiff or two would be inhaled now and then, they are not dangerous. But in a closed room they may kill in an incredibly short time. In fact, the condition has given rise to an entirely new phenomenon which someone has named Petromortis. Petromortis, repeated Snedden, who for the first time began to show interest in what was going on about him. Then it was an accident? I did not say it was an accident, corrected Craig. There is an old adage that murder will out. And this expression of human experience is only repeated in what we modern scientific detectives are doing. No man bent on the commission of a crime can so arrange the circumstances of that crime that it will afterward appear point by point as an accident. Kennedy had us all following him breathlessly now. I do not consider it an accident, he went on, rapidly piecing together the facts as we had found them. Ida Snedden was killed because she was getting too close to someone's secret. 
Even at luncheon, I could see that she had discovered Gertrude's attachment for Gerritsen. How she heard that, following the excitement of the explosion this afternoon, Gertrude and Gerritsen had disappeared, I do not pretend to know. But it is evident that she did hear, that she went out and took Jackson's car, probably to pursue them. If we have heard that they went by the river road, she might have heard it too. In all probability she came along just in time to surprise someone working on the other side of the old merry-go-round structure. There can be no reason to conceal the fact longer. From that deserted building, someone was daily launching a newly designed invisible airplane. As Mrs. Snedden came along, she must have been just in time to see that person at his secret hangar. What happened I do not know, except that she must have run the car off the river road and into the building. The person whom she found must have suddenly conceived a method of getting her out of the way and making it look like an accident of some kind, perhaps persuaded her to stay in the car with the engine running, while he went off and destroyed the airplane which was damning evidence now. Startling as was the revelation of an actual phantom destroyer, our minds were more aroused as to who might be the criminal who had employed such an engine of death. Kennedy drew from his pocket the telegram which had just arrived, and spread it out flat before us on a table. It was dated Philadelphia and read, Mrs. Ida Snedden, Nitropolis. Gerritsen and Gertrude were married today, have traced them to Walcott, tried to reconcile Mr. Snedden. Hunter Jackson. I saw at once that part of the story. It was just a plain love affair that had ended in an elopement at a convenient time. The fire-eating Gerritsen had been afraid of the Snedens and Jackson, who was their friend. Before I could even think further, Kennedy had drawn out the films taken by the rocket camera. With the aid of a magnifying glass, he was saying, I can just get enough of the lone figure in this picture to identify it. These are the crimes of a crazed pacifist, one whose mind had so long dwelt on the horrors of... Look out! shouted MacLeod, leaping in front of Kennedy. The strain of the revelation had been too much. Snedden, a raving maniac, had reeled forward, wildly and impotently, at the man who had exposed him. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of the Beauty Mask Oh, Mr. Jameson, if they could only wake her up, find out what is the matter, do something. This suspense is killing both mother and myself. Scenting a good feature story, my city editor had sent me out on an assignment, my sole equipment being a clipping of two paragraphs from the Morning Star. Girl in coma six days. Shows no sign of revival. Virginia Blakely, the nineteen-year-old daughter of Mrs. Stuart Blakely, of Riverside Drive, who has been in a state of coma for six days, still shows no sign of returning consciousness. Ever since Monday some member of her family has been constantly beside her. Her mother and sister have both vainly tried to coax her back to consciousness, but their efforts have not met with the slightest response. Dr. Calvert Haynes, the family physician, and several specialists who have been called in consultation are completely baffled by the strange malady. Often I read of cases of morbid sleep lasting for days or even for weeks, but this was the first case I had ever actually encountered and I was glad to take the assignment. The Blakeleys, as everyone knew, had inherited from Stuart Blakely a very considerable fortune in real estate in one of the most rapidly developing sections of Upper New York, and on the death of their mother the two girls, Virginia and Cynthia, would be numbered among the wealthiest heiresses of the city. They lived in a big sandstone mansion fronting the Hudson, and it was with some misgiving that I sent up my card. Both Mrs. Blakely and her other daughter, however, met me in the reception room, thinking perhaps, from what I had written on the card, that I might have some assistance to offer. Mrs. Blakely was a well-preserved lady, past middle age and very nervous. "'Mercy, Cynthia!' she exclaimed, as I explained my mission. "'It's another one of those reporters.' No, I cannot say anything. Not a word. I don't know anything. See Dr. Haynes. I... But, Mother, interposed Cynthia more calmly, the thing is in the papers. It may be that someone who reads of it may know of something that can be done. Who can tell? Well, I won't say anything, persisted the elder woman. 
I don't like all this publicity. Did the newspapers ever do anything but harm to your poor dear father? No, I won't talk. It won't do us a bit of good. And you, Cynthia, had better be careful. Mrs. Blakely backed out of the door, but Cynthia, who was a few years older than her sister, had evidently acquired independence. At least she felt capable of coping with an ordinary reporter who looked no more formidable than myself. It is quite possible that someone who knows about such cases may learn of this, I urged. She hesitated as her mother disappeared, and looked at me a moment, then, her feelings getting the better of her, burst forth with the strange appeal I have already quoted. It was though I had come at just an opportune moment when she must talk to some outsider to relieve her pent-up feelings. By an adroit question here and there, as we stood in the reception hall, I succeeded in getting the story which seemed to be more human interest than of news. I even managed to secure a photograph of Virginia as she was before the strange sleet fell on her. Briefly, as her sister told it, Virginia was engaged to Hampton Haynes, a young medical student at the college where his father was a professor of diseases of the heart. The Haineses were of a fine southern family which had never recovered from the war and had finally come to New York. The father, Dr. Calvert Haynes, in addition to being a well-known physician, was the family physician of the Blakeleys, as I already knew. Twice the date of the marriage has been set, only to be postponed, added Cynthia Blakely. We don't know what to do, and Hampton is frantic. Then this is really the second attack of the morbid sleep? I queried. Yes, in a few weeks. Only the other wasn't so long, not more than a day. She said it in a hesitating manner which I could not account for. Either she thought there might be something more back of it, or she recalled her mother's aversion to reporters and did not know whether she was saying too much or not. Do you really fear that there is something wrong? I asked significantly, hastily choosing the former explanation. Cynthia Blakely looked quickly at the door through which her mother had retreated. I, I don't know, she replied tremulously. I don't know why I am talking to you. I'm so afraid, too, that the newspapers may say something that isn't true. You would like to get at the truth if I promise to hold the story back? I persisted, catching her eye. Yes, she answered in a low tone, but then stopped. I will ask my friend Professor Kennedy at the university to come here, I urged. You know him? she asked eagerly. He will come? Without a doubt, I reassured, waiting for her to say no more, but picking up the telephone receiver on a stand in the hall. Fortunately, I found Craig at his laboratory, and a few hasty words were all that was necessary to catch his interest. I must tell Mother, Cynthia cried excitedly, as I hung up the receiver. Surely she cannot object to that. Will you wait here? As I waited for Craig, I tried to puzzle the case out for myself. Though I knew nothing about it as yet, I felt sure that I had not made a mistake and that there was some mystery here. Suddenly I became aware that the two women were talking in the next room, though too low for me to catch what they were saying. It was evident, however, that Cynthia was having some difficulty in persuading her mother that everything was all right. Well, Cynthia, I heard her mother say finally as she left the room for one farther back, I hope it will be all right. That is all I can say. What was it that Mrs. Blakely so feared? Was it merely the unpleasant notoriety? One could not help the feeling that there was something more that she suspected, perhaps knew, but would not tell. Yet apparently it was aside from her desire to have her daughter restored to normal. She was at sea herself, I felt. Poor dear mother, murmured Cynthia, rejoining me in a few moments. She hardly knows just what it is she does want, except that we want Virginia well again. We had not long to wait for Craig. What I had told him over the telephone had been quite enough to arouse his curiosity. Both Mrs. Blakely and Cynthia met him, at first a little fearfully, but quickly reassured by his manner as well as my promise to see that nothing appeared in the star which would be distasteful. Oh, if someone could only bring back our little girl, cried Mrs. Blakely, with suppressed emotion, leading the way with her daughter upstairs. It was only for a moment that I could see Craig alone to explain the impressions I had received, but it was enough. I'm glad you called me, he whispered. There is something queer. We followed them up to the dainty bedroom in flowered enamel where Virginia Blakely lay, and it was then, for the first time, that we saw her. 
Kennedy drew a chair up beside the little white bed and went to work almost as though he had been a physician himself. Partly from what I observed myself and partly from what he told me afterward, I shall try to describe the peculiar condition in which she was. She lay there lethargic, scarcely breathing. Once she had been a tall, slender, fair girl with a sort of wild grace. Now she seemed to be completely altered. I could not help thinking of the contrast between her looks now and the photograph in my pocket. Not only was her respiration slow, but her pulse was almost imperceptible, less than forty a minute. Her temperature was far below normal, and her blood pressure low. Once she had seemed fully a woman, with all the strength and promise of precocious maturity. But now there was something strange about her looks. It is difficult to describe. It was not that she was no longer a young woman, but there seemed to be something almost sexless about her. It was as though her secondary sex characteristics were no longer feminine, but, for want of a better word, neuter. Yet, strange to say, in spite of the lethargy which necessitated at least some artificial feeding, she was not falling away. She seemed, if anything, plump. To all appearances there was really a retardation of metabolism connected with the trance-like sleep. She was actually gaining in weight. As he noted one of these things after another, Kennedy looked at her long and carefully. I followed the direction of his eyes. Over her nose, just a trifle above the line of her eyebrows, was a peculiar red mark, a sore, which was very disfiguring, as though it were hard to heal. "'What is that?' he asked Mrs. Blakely finally. "'I don't know,' she replied slowly. "'We've all noticed it. It came just after the sleep began.' "'You have no idea what could have caused it?' Both Virginia and Cynthia had been going to a face specialist, she admitted, to have their skins treated for freckles. After the treatment they wore masks which were supposed to have some effect on the skin. I don't know, could it be that? Kennedy looked sharply at Cynthia's face. There was no red mark over her nose, but there were certainly no freckles on either of the girls' faces now either. Oh, mother, remonstrated Cynthia. It couldn't be anything Dr. Chappelle did. Dr. Chappelle, repeated Kennedy. Yes, Dr. Carl Chappelle, replied Mrs. Blakely. Perhaps you have heard of him. He is quite well known as a beauty parlor on Fifth Avenue. He... It's ridiculous, cut in Cynthia sharply. Why, my face was worse than Virgie's. Carr, he said it would take longer. I had been watching Cynthia, but it needed only to have heard her to see that Dr. Chappelle was something more than a beauty specialist to her. Kennedy glanced thoughtfully from the clear skin of Cynthia to the red mark on Virginia. Though he said nothing, I could see that his mind was on it. I had heard of the beauty doctors who promised to give one a skin as soft and clear as a baby's, and often, by their inexpert use of lotions and chemicals, succeed in ruining the skin and disfiguring the patient for life. Could this be a case of that sort? Yet how explain the apparent success with Cynthia? The elder sister, however, was plainly vexed at the mention of the beauty doctor's name at all, and she showed it. Kennedy made a mental note of the matter, but refrained from saying any more about it. I suppose there is no objection to my seeing Dr. Haynes, asked Kennedy, rising and changing the subject. None whatever, returned Mrs. Blakely. If there's anything you or he can do to bring Virginia out of this, anything safe, I want it done, she emphasized. Cynthia was silent as we left. Evidently, she had not expected Dr. Chappelle's name to be brought into the case. We were lucky in finding Dr. Haynes at home, although it was not the regular time for his office hours. Kennedy introduced himself as a friend of the Blakeleys, who had been asked to see that I made no blunders in writing the story for the star. Dr. Haynes did not question the explanation. He was a man well on toward the sixties, with that magnetic quality that inspires the confidence so necessary for a doctor. Far from wealthy, he had attained a high place in the profession. As Kennedy finished his version of our mission, Dr. Haynes shook his head with a deep sigh. You can understand how I feel toward the Blakeleys, he remarked at length. I should consider it unethical to give an interview under any circumstances, much more so under the present. Still, I put in, taking Kennedy's cue, just a word to set me straight can't do any harm. I won't quote you directly. He seemed to realize that it might be better to talk carefully than to leave all to my imagination. 
Well, he began slowly, I have considered all the usual causes assigned for such morbid sleep. It is not autosuggestion or trance, I am positive. Nor is there any trace of epilepsy. I cannot see how it could be due to poisoning, can you? I admitted readily that I could not. No, he resumed, it is just a case of what we call narcolepsy, pathological somnolence, a sudden uncontrollable inclination to sleep, occurring sometimes repeatedly or at varying intervals. I don't think it hysterical, epileptic, or toxemic. The plain fact of the matter, gentlemen, is that neither myself nor any of my colleagues whom I have consulted have the faintest idea what it is, yet. The door of the office opened, for it was not the hour for consulting patients, and a tall, athletic young fellow, with a keen and restless face, though very boyish, entered. My son, the doctor introduced, soon to be the sixth Dr. Haynes in direct line in the family. We shook hands. It was evident that Cynthia had not by any means exaggerated when she said that he was frantic over what had happened to his fiancée. Accordingly, there was no difficulty in reverting to the subject of our visit. Gradually, I let Kennedy take the lead in the conversation so that our position might not seem to be false. It was not long before Craig managed to inject a remark about the red spot over Virginia's nose. It seemed to excite young Hampton. Naturally, I look on it more as a doctor than a lover, remarked his father, smiling indulgently at the young man, who it was evident he regarded above everything else in the world. I have not been able to account for it either. Really, the case is one of the most remarkable I have ever heard of. You have heard of a Dr. Carl Chappelle? inquired Craig tentatively. A beauty, doctor, interrupted the young man, turning toward his father. You've met him. He's the fellow I think is really engaged to Cynthia. Hampton seemed much excited. There was unconcealed animosity in the manner of his remark, and I wondered why it was. Could there be some latent jealousy? I see, calmed Dr. Haynes. You mean to infer that this, er, this Dr. Chappelle, he paused, waiting for Kennedy to take the initiative. I suppose you've noticed over Miss Blakely's nose a red sore, hazarded Kennedy. Yes, replied Dr. Haynes, rather refractory too. I say, interrupted Hampton, who by this time had reached a high pitch of excitement. Say, do you think it could be any of his confounded nostrums back of this thing? Careful, Hampton, cautioned the elder man. I'd like to see him, pursued Craig to the younger. You know him? Know him? I should say I do. Good looking, good practice and all that, but why, he must have hypnotized that girl. Cynthia thinks he's wonderful. I'd like to see him, suggested Craig. Very well, agreed Hampton, taking him at his word. Much as I dislike the fellow, I have no objection to going down to his beauty parlor with you. Thank you, returned Craig, as we excused ourselves and left the elder Dr. Haynes. Several times in our journey down, Hampton could not resist some reference to Chappelle for commercializing the profession, remarks which sounded strangely old on his lips. Chappelle's office, we found, was in a large building on Fifth Avenue in the new shopping district where hundreds of thousands of women passed almost daily. He called the place a dermatological institute, but as Hampton put it, he practiced decorative surgery. As we entered one door, we saw the patients left by another. Evidently, as Craig whispered, when sixty sought to look like sixteen, the seekers did not like to come in contact with one another. We waited some time in a little private room. At last Dr. Chappelle himself appeared, a rather handsome man, with the manner that one instinctively feels appeals to the ladies. He shook hands with young Haynes, and I could detect no hostility on Chappelle's part, but rather a friendly interest in a younger member of the medical profession. Again I was thrown forward as a buffer. I was their excuse for being there. However, a newspaper experience gives you one thing, if no other, assurance. I believe you have a patient, a Miss Virginia Blakely, I ventured. Miss Blakely? Oh yes, and her sister also. The mention of the names was enough. I was no longer needed as a buffer. Chappelle, blurted out Hampton, you must have done something to her when you treated her face. There's a little red spot over her nose that hasn't healed yet. Kennedy frowned at the impetuous interruption, yet it was perhaps the best thing that could have happened. So, returned Chappelle, 
drawing back and placing his head on one side as he nodded it with each word. Do you think I've spoiled her looks? Aren't the freckles gone? Yes, retorted Hampton bitterly, but on her face is this new disfigurement. That, shrugged Chappelle, I know nothing of that, nor of the trance. I have only my specialty. Calm though he appeared outwardly, one could see that Chappelle was plainly worried. Under the circumstances, might not his professional reputation be at stake? What if a hint like this got abroad among his rich clientele? I looked about his shop and wondered just how much of a faker he was. Once or twice I had heard of surgeons who had gone legitimately into this sort of thing, but the common story was that of the swindler, or worse. I had heard of scores of cases of good looks permanently ruined, seldom of any benefit. Had Chappelle ignorantly done something that would leave its scar forever? Or was he one of the few who were honest and careful? Whatever the case, Kennedy had accomplished his purpose. He had seen Chappelle. If he were really guilty of anything, the chances were all in favor of his betraying it by trying to cover it up. Deftly suppressing Hampton, we managed to beat a retreat without showing our hands any further. Hm, snorted Hampton, as we rode down in the elevator and hopped on a bus to go uptown. Gave up legitimate medicine and took up this beauty doctoring. It's unprofessional, I tell you. Why, he even advertises. We left Hampton and returned to the laboratory, though Craig had no present intention of staying there. His visit was merely for the purpose of gathering some apparatus, which included a crook's tube, carefully packed, a rheostat, and some other paraphernalia which we divided. A few moments later we were on our way again to the Blakely mansion. No change had taken place in the condition of the patient, and Mrs. Blakely met us anxiously. Nor was the anxiety wholly over her daughter's condition, for there seemed to be an air of relief when Kennedy told her that we had little to report. Upstairs in the sick room, Craig sat silently to work, attaching his apparatus to an electric light socket from which he had unscrewed the bulb. As he proceeded, I saw that it was, as I had surmised, his new X-ray photographing machine which he had brought. Carefully, from several angles, he took photographs of Virginia's head, then, without saying a word, packed up his kid and started away. We were passing down the hall after leaving Mrs. Blakely when a figure stepped out from behind a portiere. It was Cynthia, who had been waiting to see us alone. "'You don't think Dr. Chappelle had anything to do with it?' she asked in a hoarse whisper. "'Then Hampton Haynes has been here?' avoided Kennedy. "'Yes,' she admitted, as though the question had been quite logical. "'He told me of your visit to Carl.' There was no concealment now of her anxiety. Indeed, I saw no reason why there should be. It was quite natural that the girl should worry over her lover if she thought there was even a haze of suspicion in Kennedy's mind. Really, I have found out nothing yet, was the only answer Craig gave, from which I readily deduced that he was well satisfied to play the game by pitting each against all, in the hope of gathering here and there a bit of truth. As soon as I find out anything, I shall let you and your mother know and you must tell me everything, too." He paused to emphasize the last words, then slowly turned again toward the door. From the corner of my eye I saw Cynthia take a step after him, pause, then take another. "'Oh, Professor Kennedy,' she called. Craig turned. "'There's something I forgot,' she continued. "'There's something wrong with Mother.' She paused, then resumed. "'Even before Virginia was taken down with this illness I saw a change. She is worried. Oh, Professor Kennedy, what is it? We have all been so happy, and now, Virgie, Mother, all I have in the world, what shall I do? Just what do you mean? asked Kennedy gently. I don't know. Mother has been so different lately, and now every night she goes out. Where? encouraged Kennedy, realizing that his plan was working. I don't know. If she would only come back looking happier. She was sobbing convulsively, over she knew not what. "'Miss Blakely,' said Kennedy, taking her hand between both of his, "'only trust me. If it is in my power, I shall bring you all out of this uncertainty that haunts you.' She could only murmur her thanks as we left. "'It is strange,' ruminated Kennedy, as we sped across the city again to the laboratory. "'We must watch Mrs. Blakely.' That was all that was said. 
although I had no inkling of what was back of it all, I felt quite satisfied at having recognized the mystery even on stumbling on it as I had. In the laboratory, as soon as he could develop the psiographs he had taken, Kennedy began a minute study of them. It was not long before he looked over at me with the expression I had come to recognize when he found something important. I went over and looked at the radiograph which he was studying. To me it was nothing but successive gradation of shadows, but to one who had studied Rentgenography as Kennedy had, each minute gradation of light and shade had its meaning. You see, pointed out Kennedy, tracing along one of the shadows with a fine-pointed pencil, and then along a corresponding position on another standard psiograph which he already had, there is a marked diminution in the size of the cella tersica, as it is called. Yet there is no evidence of a tumor. For several moments he pondered deeply over the photographs. And it is impossible to conceive of any mechanical pressure sufficient to cause such a change, he added. Unable to help him on the problem, whatever it might be, I watched him pacing up and down the laboratory. I shall have to take that picture over again, under different circumstances, he remarked, finally pausing and looking at his watch. Tonight we must follow this clue which Cynthia has given us. Call a cab, Walter. We took a stand down the block from the Blakely mansion, near a large apartment, where the presence of a cab would not attract attention. If there is any job I despise, it is shadowing. One must keep his eyes riveted on a house, for once let the attention relax and it is incredible how quickly anyone may get out and disappear. Our vigil was finally rewarded when we saw Mrs. Blakely emerge and hurry down the street. To follow her was easy for she did not suspect that she was being watched, and went afoot. On she walked, turning off the drive and proceeding rapidly toward the region of cheap tenements. She paused before one, and as our cab cruised leisurely past we saw her press a button, the last on the right-hand side, enter the door, and start up the stairs. Instantly Kennedy signaled our driver to stop, and together we hopped out and walked back, cautiously entering the vestibule. The name in the letterbox was Mrs. Reba Reinhardt. What could it mean? Just then another cab stopped up the street, and as we turned to leave the vestibule, Kennedy drew back. It was too late, however, not to be seen. A man had just alighted, and in turn had started back, also realizing that it was too late. It was Chappelle. There was nothing to do but to make the best of it. Shadowing the shadowers, queried Kennedy, keenly watching the play of his features under the arc light of the street. Miss Cynthia asked me to follow her mother the other night, he answered quite frankly, and I have been doing so ever since. It was a glib answer, at any rate, I thought. Then perhaps you know something of Reba Reinhardt, too, bluffed Kennedy. Chappelle eyed us a moment, in doubt how much we knew. Kennedy played a pair of deuces as if they had been four aces instead. Not much, replied Chappelle dubiously. I know that Mrs. Blakely has been paying money to the old woman, who seems to be ill. Once I managed to get in to see her. It's a bad case of pernicious anemia, I should say. A neighbor told me she has been to the college hospital, had been one of Dr. Haynes' cases, but that he had turned her over to his son. I have seen Hampton Haynes here, too. There was an air of sincerity about Chappelle's words. But then I reflected that there had also been a similar ring to what we had heard Hampton say. Were they playing a game against each other? Perhaps, but what was the game? What did it all mean, and why should Mrs. Blakely pay money to an old woman, a charity patient? There was no solution. Both Kennedy and Chappelle, by a sort of tacit consent, dismissed their cabs, and we strolled on over toward Broadway, watching one another furtively. We parted finally, and Kennedy and I went up to our apartment, where he sat for hours in a brown study. There was plenty to think about, even so far in the affair. He may have sat up all night. At any rate, he roused me early in the morning. Come over to the laboratory, he said. I want to take that x-ray machine up there again to Blakely's. Confound it! I hope it's not too late. I lost no time in joining him, and we were at the house long before any reasonable hour for visitors. Kennedy asked for Mrs. Blakely and hurriedly set up the X-ray apparatus. I wish you would place that face mask which she was wearing exactly as it was before she became ill, he asked. Her mother did as Kennedy directed, replacing the rubber mask as Virginia had worn it. I want you to preserve that mask, directed Kennedy, 
as he finished taking his pictures. Say nothing about it to anyone. In fact, I should advise putting it in your family safe for the present. Hastily, we drove back to the laboratory, and Kennedy set to work again developing the second set of sciographs. I had not long to wait this time for him to study them. His first glance brought me over to him as he exclaimed loudly. At the point just opposite the sore which he had observed on Virginia's forehead and overlying the cell at Tersica, there was a peculiar spot on the radiograph. Something in that mask has affected the photographic plate, he explained, his face now animated. Before I could ask him what it was, he had opened a cabinet where he kept many new things which he studied in his leisure moments. From it I saw him take several glass ampules which he glanced at hastily and shoved into his pocket, as we heard a footstep out in the hall. It was Chappelle, very much worried. Could it be that he knew his society clientele was at stake, I wondered? Or was it more than that? She's dead, he cried. The old lady died last night. Without a word, Kennedy hustled us out of the laboratory, stuffing the X-ray pictures into his pocket also as he went. As we hurried downtown, Chappelle told us how he had tried to keep a watch by bribing one of the neighbors, who had just informed him of the tragedy. It was her heart, said one of the neighbors, as we entered the poor apartment. The doctor said so. Anemia, insisted Chappelle, looking carefully at the body. Kennedy bent over also and examined the poor worn frame. As he did so, he caught sight of a heavy linen envelope tucked under her pillow. He pulled it out gently and opened it. Inside were several time-worn documents and letters. He glanced over them hastily, unfolding first the letter. Walter, he whispered furtively, looking at the neighbors in the room and making sure that none of them had seen the envelope already. Read these. That's her story. One glance was sufficient. The first was a letter from old Stuart Blakely. Reba Reinhardt had been secretly married to him and never divorced. One paper after another unfolded her story. I thought quickly. Then she had had a right in the Blakely millions. More than that, the Blakelys themselves had none, at least only what came to them by Blakely's will. I read on to see what, if any, contest she had intended to make. And as I read, I could picture old Stuart Blakely to myself. Strong, direct, unscrupulous, a man who knew what he wanted and got it. Dominant, close-mouthed, mysterious. He had understood and estimated the future of New York. On that, he had founded his fortune. According to the old lady's story, the marriage was a complete secret. She had demanded marriage when he had demanded her. He had pointed out the difficulties. The original property had come to him and would remain in his hands only on condition that he married one of his own faith. She was not of the faith and declined to become so. There had been other family reasons also. They had been married with the idea of keeping it secret until he could arrange his affairs so that he could safely acknowledge her. It was, according to her story, a ruse. When she demanded recognition, he replied that the marriage was invalid, that the minister had been unfrocked before the ceremony. She was not in law his wife and had no claim, he asserted. But he agreed to compromise in spite of it all. If she would go west and not return or intrude, he would make a cash settlement. Disillusioned, she took the offer and went to California. Somehow he understood that she was dead. Years later he married again. Meanwhile she had invested her settlement, had prospered, had even married herself thinking the first marriage void. Then her second husband died and evil times came. Blakely was dead, but she came east. Since then she had been fighting to establish the validity of the first marriage and hence her claim to dower rights. It was a moving story. As we finished reading, Kennedy gathered the papers together and took charge of them. Taking Chappelle, who by this time was in a high state of excitement over both the death and the discovery, Kennedy hurried to the Blakely mansion, stopping only long enough to telephone to Dr. Haynes and his son. Evidently the news had spread. Cynthia Blakely met us in the hall, half-frightened yet much relieved. "'Oh, Professor Kennedy!' she cried. "'I don't know what it is, but Mother seems so different. What is it all about?' As Kennedy said nothing, she turned to Chappelle, whom I was watching narrowly. "'What is it, Carl?' she whispered. I, I can't tell, he whispered back guardedly. Then, with an anxious glance at the rest of us, Is your sister any better? 
Cynthia's face clouded. Relieved though she was about her mother, there was still that horror for Virginia. Come, I interrupted, not wishing to let Chappelle get out of my sight, yet wishing to follow Kennedy, who had dashed upstairs. I found Craig already at the bedside of Virginia. He had broken one of the ampules and was injecting some of the extract in it into the sleeping girl's arm. Mrs. Blakely bent over eagerly as he did so. Even in her manner she was changed. There was anxiety for Virginia yet, but one could feel that a great weight seemed to be lifted from her. So engrossed was I in watching Kennedy that I did not hear Dr. Haynes at Hampton enter. Chappelle heard, however, and turned. For a moment he gazed at Hampton. Then with a slight curl of the lip he said in a low tone, Is it strictly ethical to treat a patient for disease of the heart when she is suffering from anemia, if you have an interest in the life and death of the patient? I watched Hampton's face closely. There was indignation in every line of it, but before he could reply Dr. Haynes stepped forward. My son was right in the diagnosis, he almost shouted, shaking a menacing finger at Chappelle. To come to the point, sir, explain that mark on Miss Virginia's forehead. Yes, demanded Hampton, also taking a step toward the beauty doctor. Explain it, if you dare. Cynthia suppressed a little cry of fear. For a moment I thought that the two young men would forget everything in the heat of their feelings. Just a second, interposed Kennedy, quickly stepping between them. Let me do the talking. There was something commanding about his tone as he looked from one to the other of us. The trouble with Miss Virginia, he added deliberately, seems to lie in one of what the scientists have lately designated the endocrine glands, in this case the pituitary. My X-ray pictures show that conclusively. Let me explain for the benefit of the rest. The pituitary is an oval glandular body composed of two lobes and a connecting area, which rest in the cella tersica, enveloped by a layer of tissue about under this point. He indicated the red spot on her forehead as he spoke. It is, as the early French surgeons called it, l'organe enigmatique. The ancients thought it discharged the pituita, or mucus, into the nose. Most scientists of the past century asserted that it was a vestigial relic of prehistoric usefulness. Today we know better. One by one the functions of the internal secretions are being discovered. Our variously acquired bits of information concerning the ductless glands lie before us like the fragments of a modern picture puzzle. And so I may tell you, in connection with recent experimental studies of the role of the pituitary, Dr. Cushing and other collaborators at Johns Hopkins have noticed a marked tendency to pass into a profoundly lethargic state when the secretion of the pituitary is totally or nearly so removed. Kennedy now had every eye riveted on him as he deftly led the subject straight to the case of the poor girl before us. This, he added, with a wave of his hand toward her, is much like what is called the Froelich syndrome, the lethargy, the subnormal temperature, slow pulse and respiration, lowered blood pressure and insensitivity, the growth of fat and the loss of sex characteristics. It has a name, dystrophia adiposogenitalis. He nodded to Dr. Haynes but did not pause. This case bears a striking resemblance to the pronounced natural somnolence of hibernation. An induced hypoproturitism, under activity of the gland, produces a result just like natural hibernation. Hibernation has nothing to do with winter or with food primarily. It is connected in some way with this little gland under the forehead. As the pituitary secretion is lessened, the blocking action of the fatigue products in the body becomes greater and morbid somnolence sets in. There is a high tolerance of carbohydrates which are promptly stored as fat. I am surprised, Dr. Haynes, that you did not recognize the symptoms. A murmur from Mrs. Blakely cut short Dr. Haynes' reply. I thought I noticed a movement of the still face on the white bed. Virgie! Virgie! called out Mrs. Blakely, dropping on her knee beside her daughter. I'm here, mother. Virginia's eyes opened ever so slightly. Her face turned just an inch or two. She seemed to be making a great effort, but it lasted only a moment. Then she slipped back into the strange condition that had baffled skilled physicians and surgeons for nearly a week. The sleep is being dispelled, said Kennedy, quietly placing his hand on Mrs. Blakely's shoulder. It is a sort of semi-consciousness now, and the improvement should soon be great. And that, I asked, 
touching the empty ampule from which he had injected the contents into her. Pituitrin, the extract of the anterior lobe of the pituitary body. Someone who had an object in removing her temporarily probably counted on restoring her to her former blooming womanhood by pituitrin, and by removing the cause of the trouble. Kennedy reached into his pocket and drew forth the second X-ray photograph he had taken. Mrs. Blakely, may I trouble you to get that beauty mask which your daughter wore? Mechanically, Mrs. Blakely obeyed. I expected Chappelle to object, but not a word broke the death-like stillness. The narcolepsy, continued Kennedy, taking the mask, was due, I find, to something that affected the pituitary gland. I have here a photograph of her taken when she was wearing the mask. He ran his finger lightly over the part just above the eyes. Feel that little lump, Walter, he directed. I did so. It was almost imperceptible, but there was something. What is it? I asked. Located in one of the best protected and most inaccessible parts of the body, Kennedy considered slowly, how could the pituitary be reached? If you will study my sciograph, you will see how I got my first clue. There was something over that spot which caused the refractory sore. What was it? Radium. Carefully placed in the mask with guards of lead foil in such a way as to protect the eyes, but direct the emissions full at the gland which was to be affected, and the secretion stopped. Chappelle gave a gasp. He was pale and agitated. Some of you have already heard of Reba Reinhardt, shot out Kennedy, suddenly changing the subject. Mrs. Blakely could not have been more astounded if a bomb had dropped before her. Still kneeling before Virginia's bed, she turned her startled face at Kennedy, clasping her hands in appeal. It was for my girls that I tried to buy her off, for their good name, their fortune, their future, she cried imploringly. Kennedy bent down. I know that is all, he reassured, then facing us went on. Behind that old woman was a secret of romantic interest. She was contemplating filing suit in the courts to recover a widow's interest in the land on which now stands the homes of millionaires, hotel palaces, luxurious apartments and popular theatres, millions of dollars' worth of property. Cynthia moved over and drew her arms about the convulsed figure of her mother. Someone else knew of this old marriage of Stuart Blakely, proceeded Kennedy, knew of Reba Reinhardt, knew that she might die at any moment. But until she died, none of the Blakeleys could be entirely sure of their fortune. It flashed over me that Chappelle might have conceived the whole scheme, seeking to gain the entire fortune for Cynthia. Who was interested enough to plot this postponement of the wedding until the danger to the fortune was finally removed? I caught sight of Hampton Haynes, his eyes riveted on the face on the bed before us. Virginia stirred again. This time her eyes opened wider. As if in a dream, she caught sight of the face of her lover and smiled wanly. Could it have been Hampton? It seemed incredible. The old lady is dead, pursued Kennedy tensely. Her dower right died with her. Nothing could be gained by bringing her case back again, except to trouble the Blakeleys in what is rightfully theirs. Gathering up the beauty mask, the X-ray photographs, and the papers of Mrs. Reinhardt, Kennedy emphasized with them the words as he whipped them out suddenly. Postponing the marriage, and at the possible expense of Chappelle, until Reba Reinhardt was dead, and trusting to a wrong diagnosis and Hampton's inexperience as the surest way of bringing that result about quickly, it was your inordinate ambition for your son, Dr. Haynes, that led you on. I shall hold these proofs until Virginia Blakely is restored completely to health and beauty. End of chapter 6